The British royal family we know today are just one generation amongst a remarkable monarchy spanning over a thousand years. But how did an ancestry that once ruled the lands eventually forfeit power? With over a millennium of bloody succession wars, global conquests, betrayals, and grand stone buildings still standing tall, all royal history has been documented and preserved. With countless kings and queens, each with their own stories, this is the entire history of the British monarchy. Our story doesn't begin with the Scots, or with the English for that matter, but with a Saxon prince named Egbert III. At the time of Egbert III's birth in 771 AD, England did not exist. Instead, the British Isles looked like this. A patchwork of warring kingdoms made up of Angles, Saxons, Jutes, and Britons, all fighting one another for control and influence over the Dominion. Born to Eilmund, King of Kent, and grandson of Eif, King of Wessex, the young Prince Egbert had strong claims to both territories. His father died when Egbert was ten, and a bloody scramble for the crown ensued. It eventually came to rest on the head of Beothric of Mercia. A young Egbert challenged Beothric's rule and lost. Forced to take refuge in the nearby court of Mercia, and eventually sent into exile in Francia, Egbert was forced to bide his time. Learning from the French courts of Charlemagne and gaining experience as a military leader on the continent, Egbert grew into a king who was about to change the course of English history. In 800 AD, after the death of Beothric, Egbert crossed the Channel, returning to the land of his father and made his claim to the throne of Wessex. Despite overwhelming support in both Europe and within the Wessex nobility, Egbert's ascension was by no means easy. Threats from nearby kingdoms were constant, and after losing his brother-in-law on the day of his ascension to an invading army of Mercians, Egbert was finally crowned King of Wessex in 802 AD. Immediately, he set about consolidating his power. He took control of the kingdoms of Kent, Essex, Sussex, and Cornwall, as well as large swathes of Wales. Even the Kingdom of Northumbria eventually submitted to the Crown of Wessex, placing all Anglo-Saxon kingdoms in Britain under the direct and indirect rule of Egbert of Wessex. Well, almost all. His old enemy, the Kingdom of Mercia, was a different story. The two sides had been locked in a constant state of warfare for centuries, with each kingdom trading territory and blood as the years wore on. King Egbert of Wessex would see brief success driving the King of Mercia, Wheelof, out of his lands. But he was unable to hold them and Wheelof returned only a year later. Despite this though, the Anglo-Saxon chronicles remember Egbert favorably. For his role in uniting the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of Britain, they bestowed onto him the title of Bretwalda, or Wide Ruler of Britain. And while he was never able to fully conquer the Mercian crown, his rule changed the landscape of Britain forever. Egbert of Wessex set in motion a policy of consolidation and expansion that his offspring would continue to enforce for the next 200 years, eventually leading to the unification of Britain and the birth of England. But there's still a lot of mess before we get there. King Egbert of Wessex died in 839 AD and was succeeded by his eldest son Ethelwolf, who soon faced a new threat, the Danes. Adorned in animal skins and brandishing axes stained with blood, the Danish invasion officially began in 842 AD. While Ethelwolf was victorious at the Battle of Aclea in 851 AD, driving the Danes back into the seas, he knew that this was just the beginning. The new threat worried the kingdoms of Britain so much that it forced Mercia and Wessex into an uneasy alliance with one another, putting an end to an almost 300-year conflict. Ethelwolf was succeeded by his son Ethelbald, whose reign was short and unpopular, especially amongst the clergy. This was mainly because of the new king's decision to marry his father's widow, something that even at this time was considered weird. After just four years of rule, Ethelbald died, passing the crown of Wessex onto his younger brother, Adelbert. 
Like his father before him, Adalbert too was threatened by foreign invaders from the north. Viking raids along the coast, led by Ragnar Lodbrok and his son Ivar the Boneless, had been growing in violence and frequency, with Viking forces even sacking the Wessex capital of Winchester in 865 AD. Adalbert rallied his troops and drove the Vikings back, but died of unknown causes that autumn leaving the throne to his younger brother, Adelred I, who was about to inherit an island on the verge of a major upheaval. The same year of Adelred's ascension, 867 AD, the Vikings captured and settled the town of York, establishing the first major Danish foothold on English soil. Adelred had no choice but to meet the great heathen army in battle. Together with his younger brother Alfred, they gathered an army and marched out to defeat their invaders. The cautious King Avalred was defeated at the Battle of Reading in 871 AD, but was saved by his younger brother at the Battle of Ashdown the same year. Impatient as only the young are, Alfred took his army while King Avalred prayed and met the Danes in open battle. He pushed the Viking horde back and bought his brother's kingdom some time but the Danes rallied and struck the armies of Wessex again, securing victories at the battles of Basing and Merton. Adelred died from his wounds, leaving the throne to his younger brother Alfred, who now inherited a kingdom on the brink of collapse. In 874 AD, the great heathen army marched on the Kingdom of Mercia, defeating Burgred of Mercia and forcing the king into exile. With Mercia defeated, all that stood between the northern invaders and total control of England was Alfred and the Kingdom of Wessex. As Danish forces closed in all around him, Alfred was pushed back and forced into a remote marsh in Somerset. He'd been betrayed by his allies, who now chose to negotiate with the invaders rather than fight. Total Danish control of Britain looked imminent, but the young king had not given up hope. He emerged from the marsh and surprised the Danish army in Eddington, chasing the Danish King Guthrum back to his base in Chippenham and forcing the Danes into a siege. Guthrum held out for two weeks before he surrendered to Alfred's forces and Alfred was victorious. The terms were simple, Guthrum was to leave Wessex and receive a Christian baptism. The Danish King obliged and after his baptism was solemnized at Wedmore, he retreated to East Anglia, leaving Alfred to consolidate his gains. Victorious, Alfred took on a new name, Alfred the Great. With the Viking threat tamed, Alfred set about transforming Anglo-Saxon society for the better. He established fortified towns throughout his kingdom, built schools and encouraged the acquisition of knowledge. There's even an unsubstantiated myth that he founded Oxford University. But perhaps his most important policy was the establishment of Dane law. England was to be divided. The South and East belonged to the Saxons and Saxon law applied, while the North and West belonged to the Danes and thus were subject to Dane law. This divide is still seen culturally, politically and financially in Britain today. Alfred brought Anglo-Saxon England into a golden age. He tamed the Danish threat and kickstarted a new age of Saxon rule that permanently changed the landscape of Britain forever. Alfred the Great was succeeded by his son, Edward the Elder, in 899 AD. Edward was in many ways like his father, learned, pious, and a keen military tactician. His reign focused on two things, improving the administration of his lands and increased expansion both north and south. He was able to capture the Viking capital of York, but only held it for a year before he was forced to abandon it. He also successfully defeated the Viking presence in southern England, and now either directly or indirectly ruled over all the old kingdoms, barring Northumbria, which was still under Viking control. Edward the Elder died in 924 AD from wounds he received while quashing a Mercian rebellion in Chester and passed his crown onto his son, Athelstan. After consolidating his power at home, Athelstan set his sights north and did what his father could not. 
he conquered the Kingdom of Northumbria and took control of the Viking capital of York, conquering the last Viking territory on the island and pushing the Danes into Scotland. He continued his campaign into the Scottish territories, and after heavy losses on both sides, he emerged victorious at the Battle of Brunanburh, forcing the Scottish king to pledge overlordship to him. This made him the first true ruler over all the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms in Britain, with his control extending from the shores of Cornwall up to the highlands of Scotland. By uniting the Anglo-Saxons, Avelstand formed the Kingdom of England and is thus remembered as the first real English king. With the realm now firmly under his control, King Avelstan continued the policies and reforms of his grandfather, Alfred the Great. He centralized government, brought about massive legal reform in the realm, and concerned himself with European politics in a way his predecessors seldom had. He died in 939 AD, passing the throne onto his half-brother, Edmund the Magnificent. Edmund's reign would be almost entirely focused on keeping his half-brother's kingdom together. He faced continuous threats from the Danish, who had now settled north of the border. Shortly after Edmund's ascension, they revolted against the new king, retaking York and mounting destructive raids on the Midlands. But like his predecessor, Edmund the Magnificent wasn't to be messed with. Leading his army north, he briefly stopped to quash a Welsh rebellion that had been brewing since before Avelstyn's death. He then defeated the Danes at the Siege of Leicester and sent his armies into Scotland, seeking revenge against the King of Strathclyde for his decision to side with the Danish during the recapturing of York. He deposed the King of Strathclyde and installed Malcolm I of Scotland on the condition that Edmund would have overlordship of the territory. This gave Edmund control, directly and indirectly, of the entire island of Great Britain. But for all his successes, Edmund the Magnificent could not escape a violent death. In 946 AD, while attending a St. Augustine's Mass in Gloucestershire, Edmund was attacked and killed by a thief named Leofa, who the king had previously banished for his crimes. Edmund the Magnificent was buried at Glastonbury Abbey and the realm scrambled to find his successor. Since Edmund's two sons were too young to rule, the burden of the crown fell to Edmund's brother, Edred, who reigned for nine years before succumbing to an unknown intestinal illness in 955 AD. Edmund's eldest son, Edwig, was now 15 and took the crown as his own. He decided to split the realm between himself and his younger brother, Edgar, ruling everything south of the River Thames while Edgar ruled the north. King Edwig's reign was short, with the young king dying just four years after his coronation. He passed the Kingdom of England in its entirety to his younger brother, Edgar the Peaceful, in 959 AD. His reign was, as the name might suggest, considered a peaceful golden age where England was free from external attacks and internal disorder. He introduced a standardized coinage and was at the helm of the English Benedictine religious reforms that swept across the realm. But this peace did not last. His death in 975 AD thrust England back into a period of conflict and uncertainty. The throne was disrupted by Edgar's two remaining sons, Edward the Martyr and Ethelred the Unready. Edward successfully took the throne in 975 AD, but was murdered just four years later in circumstances not totally clear to us today. His younger brother Ethelred soon took charge at just 12 years old. Before the young king had even a hair on his chin, an old enemy reared from far in the north. The Danes had returned and set about raiding English territories again. With every year, the threat grew more serious, and soon the English king could not afford to ignore them any longer. He gathered his armies and marched north, but was eventually defeated at the Battle of Malden. Seeking a compromise, King Ethelred II was forced to pay off the Danish king and leave them to settle in the Kingdom of Northumbria. But, as it turns out, the king was not content to just let the invaders be. A decade after his defeat, he ordered the infamous St. Bryce's Day Massacre, 
a brutal slaughtering of a Danish settlement which had dire consequences to not only his rule, but his entire family's place in history. Hearing of the attack on his people, King Svein Forkbeard of Denmark sailed to England, forcing Ethelred to flee to Normandy in 1013 AD. Sven Forkbeard ruled over England for just four weeks before his sudden and mysterious death. Seizing the opportunity, Ethelred returned and quickly retook control of the crown. Despite the brief Danish interruption, Ethelred's 37-year reign was the longest of any Anglo-Saxon king, and it would become the last period of royal stability until the 12th century, almost 100 years later. King Ethelred the Unready died in 1016 AD, and the crown was passed on to his son, Edmund Ironside, who, like so many of those before him, was now forced to clean up the mess his father had made. You see, unbeknownst to Edmund, the Danish King Svein had a son, Canute the Great, who had been amassing an army in Denmark and preparing it to sail to England. Just weeks after the death of his father, and with the coronation wine barely out of his system, Edmund was forced to meet Canute and the Danes in battle. He was unsuccessful. With Edmund wounded, the two reached an agreement. Edmund Ironside was to rule Wessex, while Canute could have the rest of the country. This was October 30th. By November 18th, Edmund was dead and Canute assumed kingship over the entire realm. After 214 years of hegemony, the House of Wessex had officially lost its control over England, ruling uninterrupted since Egbert III in 802 AD. 1016 would prove to be the dawn of a new age on the British Isles, the Age of Danes. After centuries of Danish activity on the island, a Danish king now sat on the English throne. Canute the Great was crowned in 1016 AD and wasted no time proving he was an astute leader and capable king. He understood that to rule the English, he would need their help. He appointed English counselors and clergymen, choosing to uphold the traditional customs and values of the land he'd inherited rather than to suppress them. He married the widow of Ethelred the Unready and allied himself closely to the church, all of which helped Canute cement his legitimacy in 1017 AD. In 1018, he was crowned King of Denmark and later conquered Sweden, uniting the three kingdoms to create the North Sea Alliance. Medieval historians look back on Canute's reign favorably. His presence brought stability to England and allowed the realm to flourish now that the threat of Viking raiders had been eliminated. He died in 1035 AD and the crown was to be given to his son, Harold Harefoot. Harold had not been the first choice for succession, but with his older brother Hardiknuk stuck in Norway dealing with a Swedish rebellion, therefore it was decided that Harold would be appointed king instead. This was not a popular decision, and many in the realm opposed it, most notably Godwin the Earl of Wessex and Emma of Normandy, Harold's stepmother and the widow of Ethelred the Unready. She'd had two other sons while with Ethelred both of whom had been exiled to Normandy after the Danish conquest. But now, with Hardignut absent and Harold struggling to consolidate his power, she called on them to return to England and take back their father's throne. Alfred the Noble and Edward the Confessor sailed across the Channel with a large army and sought support from the House of Wessex. But Godwin, who'd initially opposed Harold's claim to the throne, betrayed the young princes and seized Alfred the Noble with the aim of delivering him to Harold Harefoot. Fearing he would be next, Edward the Confessor fled back to Normandy, this time taking his mother with him to safety. During his captivity, Alfred the Noble was blinded and eventually succumbed to his wounds in 1036 AD. Harold would rule for just four more years before dying in 1040. Hearing of his half-brother's passing, Hardignut returned from Scandinavia and crowned himself King of England that same year. But like his brother, his reign too would be short and he died in 1042 AD from an unknown illness. He had no sons and during the last years of his life, Perhaps encouraged by his mother Emma of Normandy, 
He called his half-brother Edward the Confessor back from exile and named him as his heir. King Hardignut's passing would mark the last time a Dane sat on the English throne. With Edward now on the throne, England was once again ruled by an Anglo-Saxon king. Except, Edward was only really Anglo-Saxon by blood. He'd spent 25 years of his life in exile in Normandy, and as a result, had an extremely Norman outlook on things. He appointed Norman counselors and Norman church leaders and opted to speak French as opposed to Old English. He is best remembered as the founder of Westminster Abbey, still a major landmark in use in London today. As his life drew to an end and with no sons to succeed him, Edward was expected to choose an heir. He was left with two options, Harold Godwinson, a prominent Earl of Wessex, and William, Duke of Normandy. Choosing Harold made more political sense. He was Anglo-Saxon and came from a prominent family, with ties to both the court of King Edward the Confessor and the former Danish king, Canute the Great. Meanwhile, William had been an aide to Edward during his exile in Normandy and was related to the Anglo-Saxon king through Emma of Normandy, who was his aunt. The issues that arose from Edward the Confessor's succession was that it wasn't clear what the king had wanted. There are rumors that he'd promised the throne to William, but those claims are unsupported. In 1065 AD, Edward the Confessor slipped suddenly into a coma, never clarifying who was to take over the English crown. Edward died on the 5th of January, 1066. A day later, Harold was crowned King of England at the newly built Westminster Abbey. Upon hearing the news of Harold's ascension, William of Normandy was outraged and began preparing to invade the island. What followed was a brief period of warfare that was about to shape England forever. King Harold found himself in an unfavorable position. He knew of William's invasion force and gathered his armies along the coast, expecting the Norman Duke to set sail soon after he had been crowned. But William didn't. Bad weather made the channel too rough to sail across, and William was forced to postpone his invasion by several months. Back in England, and with provisions starting to run out, Harold was forced to disband his army and return to London. That same day, on the 8th of September, 1066, a new threat appeared. Only this time, far up north. Harold Hardrada, King of Norway, had arrived in Northumbria and defeated the English earls in charge of protecting the northern kingdoms. Harold had no choice but to react. He hastily regrouped his army and began a forced march north of nearly 400 kilometers to meet the Viking invaders. It took four days for King Harold and his men to reach modern-day Yorkshire, but on the 25th of September, they faced off against the Norwegian army at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Just outside the city of York, the English army clashed with the Norse invaders. Hardrada was killed and Harold emerged victorious, stopping the invasion dead in its tracks. But Harold had little time to rest. Just two days after his victory at Stamford Bridge, word reached the king that the Norman invasion fleet had finally set sail for England. He gathered what men he had left and began the 400-kilometer march back to the English capital. Meanwhile, William of Normandy and around 7,000 men landed at Pevensey Bay in East Sussex and quickly took control of the old Roman fortifications nearby. It took King Harold and his army a week to reach the southern English coast, and Harold hoped his speech would catch William and his men by surprise. But Norman scouts had spotted Harold's army moving down and warned William of the king's arrival. On October 14th, 1066, a date forever etched in the annals of British history, the two armies clashed. The battle began at 9 a.m. and lasted the entire day. The English shield walls initially stood strong, surprising the Norman duke and forcing him back, but William had come prepared. While Harold had only foot soldiers, the Norman Duke had brought with him cavalry and archers to supplement his main force. The Norman army feigned a retreat, which prompted the English troops to rush forward. This allowed the Norman cavalrymen to rout the disorganized English foot soldiers and slaughter them where they stood. Harold, the last Anglo-Saxon King of England, was killed by an arrow which struck him in the eye. 
Harold's mother reportedly begged William for her son's body back, offering to pay his weight in gold for custody of her son's corpse. But William refused. Legend has it he threw the body into the ocean, allowing the waves of the English Channel to swallow the Saxon king, never to be seen again. William of Normandy was victorious. He marched on London, burning his way through southern England and forcing lords to swear fealty to him as he went. He was crowned on Christmas Day 1066, marking the beginning of the Norman Age of England. His ascension to the English throne earned the Norman Duke a new name, William the Conqueror. As king by conquest, William now faced the unenviable challenge of consolidating his power. He brutally punished those who had stood against him by confiscating their lands, removing their royal titles, and executing anyone he deemed a threat to his rule. Families that had remained neutral during the invasion, or were quick to pledge their support to William after it, were rewarded and allowed to continue operating as they had before. Some were even allowed to marry into the new royal family. But a change in leadership was not all William brought with him. One of his most enduring policies was the construction of Mott and Bailey castles throughout his kingdom. Initially made from wood and later rebuilt with stone, these fortifications became the landmark feature of William's rule in England. From Pevensey, where he first landed, to as far north as modern-day Newcastle, these buildings were a sign of William's strength and influence over the land. Historians estimate that around 500 of these castles were built within the first 20 years of Norman rule alone and they gave William and those loyal to him a position from which to defend themselves against revolts and usurpers, of which there were many. William's first test came when his former ally Eustace, the Count of Boulogne, rebelled at Dover. Unhappy with his spoils of the conquest, he rallied local troops against the king and attempted to take Dover Castle. But he failed and was forced to return the land he had won. Next, the king was faced with a number of English rebellions further inland. There was Edric the Wild in Wessex, as well as Githa, mother of Harold Godwinson, organizing revolts as south as Exeter. William dealt with those rebellions swiftly and with relatively little bloodshed. But in 1069 AD, the north rose up in revolt, and William responded in what would later be known as the Harrying of the North. It was a put-down so brutal that it left the areas of York and Durham underpopulated for centuries after. But his show of force had done its job. England was now firmly in his control. With this stability, the king felt confident enough to travel between England and the continent with increasing frequency. After 1072, he gave up making the journey and spent the majority of his time in Normandy, leaving England to be ruled by his half-brother Odo of Bayeux and his wife Matilda of Flanders. It was during this time that the first ever national census was conducted in England. The dramatically named Doomsday Book was, in effect, a royal survey of all the lands in England simply for administrative and tax purposes. Its name derives from the Christian Day of Judgment, and the aim of the project was to streamline and regulate tax collection in the realm. Its historical relevance cannot be understated as it gave historians an incredibly detailed look into what life was like at the time of the Norman invasion. And it currently lives in the National Archives at Kew in London. A year after the book was completed, on the 9th of September 1087 AD, William the Conqueror died of dysentery while on expedition in France. As was the custom of the time, he divided his properties between his three living sons. Robert got Normandy, William got England, and Henry... Henry got money. While the new king, William, may have inherited his father's lands and name, he had unfortunately inherited little else. Crowned king a month after his father's death, he quickly established himself as an unpopular, greedy, and self-centered ruler. He was a poor administrator who frequently angered the church and provoked his nobility with an unpredictable temperament and unyielding attitude. It's perhaps no surprise then that after 13 years of rule, King William II met his end during a hunting accident. The details of which aren't totally clear, but it is reported that William stepped in front of a stray arrow, dying of his wounds on the spot. 
The man who shot the arrow, William Tyrell, fled after giving his account of the ordeal. With King William II dead, the throne was to be passed on to his older brother, Robert, Duke of Normandy. But Henry, the youngest of the three, had other ideas. With Robert busy on the continent ruling as Duke of Normandy, Henry took control of the royal treasury in London and proclaimed himself King of England in 1100 AD. Robert did eventually challenge his younger brother for the English throne, but King Henry was victorious at the Battle of Tinchebrae in 1106. Defeated, Robert was stripped of his dukedom and would spend the rest of his life in prison. Thankfully for England, Henry I turned out to be a much better ruler than his brother before him. He successfully expanded royal administration throughout the realm and further solidified the rule of law. He set up the court of the Exchequer to directly handle all financial matters, something which greatly improved the processes of collecting taxes and granting charters. He ruled for 35 long, peaceful, and prosperous years during a time of great social and political change on the island. Many of the administrators King Henry had appointed were new men, obscure, untitled subjects who had risen through the ranks through sheer brilliance and ability and not simply because of their names. But tragedy struck Henry during his twilight years. His son and eventual heir to the English throne, William Adeline, died in the wreck of the White Ship while returning from France. The widower Henry was forced to remarry in the hopes of having another son. When it became clear Henry would not bear another son, he decided to name his daughter Matilda as his successor to the throne. This was an unprecedented move, and while many barons publicly swore fealty to the future empress, privately they had other ideas. King Henry I died in 1135 AD, believing that he had solved the issue of succession. Immediately, however, the barons of England abandoned the dead king's wishes in favor of a different claimant, Henry's nephew, Stephen of Blois. You see, the English nobility weren't keen on the idea of a woman ruling the country. English society believed a woman simply couldn't rule as effectively as a man. Patriarchal biases aside, Stephen of Blois was a well-known and well-liked figure within the Anglo-Saxon upper class. He was respected, well-mannered, decisive, and best of all, wealthy, traits that made him an attractive prospect to put on the English throne. Matilda, meanwhile, was stubborn, arrogant, and because she had been married off at a young age to the Holy Roman Emperor and therefore spent her life away from England, she was considered by many a foreigner. What followed was a period of English history that later came to be known as the Anarchy. The news of King Henry's death reached Stephen of Blois first, and he crossed the channel and crowned himself king in 1135 AD, arguing that the stability of the land took precedence over any earlier commitments to support Matilda as Henry's heir. Matilda, who now was married to the Count of Anjou, was still in Europe, and news of her father's passing was slow to reach her. As a result, King Stephen enjoyed an early period of ruling that was free of turmoil and challenge. When news reached Matilda of Stephen's usurpation, she was furious. In 1139, she crossed the channel and traveled to the court of her half-brother, Robert the Earl of Gloucester, seeking his support against the usurper king. Robert obliged. Trouble began in 1141 when the king's forces met Robert's army at the Battle of Lincoln. King Stephen is said to have fought bravely but was overwhelmed by Robert's men. The captured king was then taken to speak with Matilda. She immediately imprisoned Stephen at Bristol Castle and set out for London with one aim in mind, her coronation. But her attempts at becoming queen were soon halted. She faced bitter opposition from the crowds that had gathered in the capital. These were not soldiers, but ordinary citizens. Forced to retreat, her half-brother Robert was captured during the rout of Winchester, and only by releasing King Stephen did Empress Matilda secure her half-brother's safety. With Stephen free once again, the fighting continued. Empress Matilda was herself captured at the town of Devizes, but managed to slip away from the king's men by pretending to be a corpse on a cart. She was again captured and this time held at Oxford Castle, 
but Matilda mounted another daring escape, lowering herself from the castle walls on a rope during a snowstorm. Wearing white so as to camouflage herself, the Empress traversed the bitter cold and made her way to the town of Wallingford by night, making sure to avoid detection from hastily formed search parties that hoped to find her. The war soon turned into a stalemate as neither side could claim they controlled much of anything. In 1153, Matilda's son Henry landed in England and began building his own alliances with power barons to support his mother's claim to the throne. But Empress Matilda had grown tired of the fighting and by now had retreated to Normandy, passing her claim solely on to her son. King Stephen was in a similar position with his rule undermined by the constant fighting, so he agreed to the Treaty of Westminster. It stated that King Stephen would remain king for life, and then Henry, the lawful heir, would succeed him as King of England upon his death. As it turns out, Stephen only lived for another year and died in 1154 AD, passing the English throne to Henry. From the ashes of the Civil War, England was reborn under a new family, one that would eventually rule over the island for almost half a millennia. Introducing the Plantagenets. Henry II was crowned King of England on the 19th of December 1154 AD and immediately set about fixing his kingdom. 18 years of civil war had taken its toll, and the realm his grandfather had ruled over less than a lifetime ago was now unrecognizable. The treasury was virtually empty, royal administration was almost non-existent, and local lords had slowly wrestled power away from the crown, weakening its influence in the realm. Henry began by restoring the power of royal administrations, as well as re-establishing English hegemony over Wales. He raised unlicensed castles that had sprung up during the Anarchy and reclaimed many of the rights and powers the crown had lost during the reign of King Stephen. Next, Henry focused on restoring the crown's finances. The war had disrupted almost all the king's traditional sources of income, and as a result, Henry inherited a kingdom that had lost an estimated 46% of its funding. Faced with an administrative nightmare, the king needed help. He was soon introduced to a cleric from London who had earned a reputation as an astute and capable administrator. His name was Thomas Beckett. Ruthlessly efficient and brilliant at this post, Beckett was appointed Lord Chancellor in 1155, giving him direct control over the king's sources of revenue. Beckett was successful at his new post, and King Henry had a lot of admiration for the Chancellor. As a new man, Beckett championed the idea set forward by Henry's grandfather, that of promotion through ability and not title. And even beyond this, the two men quickly became friends. The king even sent his son Henry to live in the Beckett household as a young boy, highlighting just how close the two families really were. So, when the Archbishop of Canterbury died, Henry saw a golden opportunity. Wanting to reassert his rights over the church in England, which had been growing increasingly powerful in recent years, King Henry II encouraged a reluctant Thomas Becket to take up the position of Archbishop. It was a win-win for Henry. Becket was a powerful chancellor, and his new position as Archbishop would weaken him politically meaning Becket would have to rely more on King Henry for support. Moreover, Henry assumed his old friend would act in the crown's best interest, weakening the church's growing influence over the Kingdom of England. But he was wrong. Almost immediately after his ordination in 1162 AD, Thomas Becket changed. He abandoned his links to the royal family and fashioned himself as a new protector of religious rights. Henry's plan had backfired enormously. Their friendship did little to stop them from clashing on a number of issues, mainly the question of the supremacy of ecclesiastical courts. Put simply, during Henry's reign, clergy members could only be tried for their crimes in church courts. The king didn't like this, as it made the crown appear weak and subservient, implying that the church and its clergy were above royal ordinance. Add to this the fact that a huge portion of England's administrative body was made up of clergymen, and Henry was anxious to wrestle power back from the church. He argued that criminous clerks should be tried in royal courts instead, 
Becket disagreed. This enraged King Henry II, who was known for having a wild and unpredictable temperament. Fearing for his life, Archbishop Becket fled to France, where the Pope was forced to intervene, mediating a fragile peace between the old friends. Upon his return, Becket immediately angered Henry by excommunicating the bishops who had supported the king during the archbishop's exile. Henry flew into another rage and four knights, perhaps hoping to curry favor from the king, rode to Canterbury and killed Becket on the steps of his altar where he stood. It was a shocking move, and one that Henry came to deeply regret. Filled with remorse, King Henry walked to Canterbury Cathedral in sackcloth and ashes, allowing himself to be whipped by the monks there. Becket was martyred, and the power of the church grew as a consequence. Henry's own demise would eventually come at the hands of his three sons. In 1173, the heir to the English throne, young Henry, rebelled against his father. Joined by his two brothers, Richard and Geoffrey, as well as several European states, the Great Revolt began, and King Henry II was forced to meet the rebels in battle. The revolt was only stopped thanks to Henry's talented local commanders, many of whom were new men appointed for their loyalty and administrative skill. Young Henry and Geoffrey led another revolt a decade later in 1183, but they were again unsuccessful and died a few years after. Philip II, King of France, swayed a neutral Richard to his side, and together they led one last revolt against King Henry II of England. With his army defeated, the king retreated to his castle in Anjou, where he died from a bleeding ulcer shortly after in 1189. Having forced his father off the throne, Richard prepped himself to take over. Richard I was crowned king at Westminster Abbey on the 3rd of September, 1198. Fondly remembered in English history as Richard the Lionheart for his bravery and skill in battle, Richard's rule is unique as he spent the majority of it abroad fighting in what would later be known as the Third Crusades. In fact, King Richard spent just 10 months in England before leaving to join Philip II of France on his crusade to liberate Jerusalem from Muslim invaders. Richard proved himself to be a brilliant military strategist, and he fought cruelly and decisively as he led his army deep into the Levant. His rivalry with Muslim commander Saladin became the stuff of legend, and the Crusaders were able to recapture a sizable portion of their territory back. But as a result, England quickly became an afterthought to King Richard. He used the realm mainly to finance his wars in the Middle East. After failing to retake Jerusalem, King Richard was captured by Leopold of Austria, a personal enemy of the English king, and held for ransom. John, the youngest of Henry II's children and brother of Richard, had been left in administrative charge of the realm. When news reached him of his brother's capture, he was hesitant to pay the £60,000 ransom. With help from the Archbishop of Canterbury and his mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, King Richard's ransom was paid and he was free once more. But Richard the Lionheart died as he lived, fighting. Struck by a crossbow bolt in France, the wound quickly turned gangrenous, and it was apparent to all that the king wouldn't make it. Richard reportedly asked to have the crossbow man brought before him and was surprised when a boy was thrown at his feet. The child said King Richard had killed his father and brother and that he had intended to kill Richard in revenge. He expected to be executed, but in one final act of mercy, Richard the Lionheart forgave him, saying, Live on, and by my bounty, behold the light of day. Richard died in his mother's arms on the 6th of April, 1199. Chroniclers of this time said this of the king's death, the lion by the ant was slain. With his brother now dead, John was crowned King of England in 1199 AD. Like his older brother before him, John too was given a nickname, although one far less romantic. He was called John Lackland, or Lack of Land, as he was not expected to inherit any significant lands upon his father's death. But as fate would have it, as the youngest of Henry II's four sons, John had not been involved in any of the wars against his father, 
and had therefore been given lands in Ireland and France as a thank you for his loyalty. Unfortunately though, this was about as good as it got for King John. While Richard the Lionheart was an absent but popular king, John was the complete opposite. He was a poor administrator, a greedy statesman, and a terrible fighter, whose over-involvement in ruling led to a sharp decline in the power of the English crown. In 1204, he lost all his family's lands on the continent, severing the aristocracy of Normandy from England for the first time since William the Conqueror's accession in 1066. He was briefly excommunicated in 1209 by Pope Innocent III after an argument with his clergy, and was becoming increasingly unpopular with the barons of England for his poor leadership and decision-making. After failing to recapture his territories of Normandy, King John was forced to return to England and face a powerful rebellion from his barons. Unhappy with the king's new fiscal policies and demanding that their rights as nobility be respected, they forced the king into signing the Great Document, or the Magna Carta, in 1215 AD. The English crown changed forever that day as the king agreed to be bound by common law and tradition especially where it affected the rights and privileges of the nobility. It essentially put the crown directly under the rule of law, as opposed to the other way around as it had been since England was founded. Its impact was astronomical, although not immediate. While it was nothing more than a power grab by the barons of England, it eventually went on to form the basis of the English constitution and included several clauses that were later interpreted as definitions of democratic freedom and the rights of an individual under common law. King John had hoped that by signing the Magna Carta, he could appease his nobility and stop a war from breaking out in the kingdom. But once again, he was wrong. Still unhappy with King John's rule, the First Barons' War ignited in England in 1215. But despite backing from the King of France, the English barons were unable to score any decisive victories over King John and his men, and the war quickly became a stalemate. While on campaign, King John died of dysentery he'd contracted while overindulging on peaches. A fitting death, perhaps. As a result, the throne was passed on to his son Henry, who now had the unpleasant task of finishing what his father had started. At just nine years of age, Henry III was crowned King of England on October 28, 1216. Inheriting a kingdom on fire, the new King Henry was faced with the challenge of ending the First Barons' War. The King's army was led by William Marshall, First Earl of Pembrokeshire, and servant to five English rulers before him. He was a brilliant commander and successfully defeated the Baron army at the Battle of Lincoln and the Battle of Sandwich that same year. With the barons defeated, they now had to answer to their new king. Henry showed great diplomacy and maturity by promising to abide by the Magna Carta, agreeing to limit his royal power and protect the rights of the nobility. With the rebellion quashed, Henry now turned his attention to repairing his kingdom. With the help of able statesmen and administrators, the next few years of King Henry's reign focused on regaining royal control that had been lost during the war. In 1230 AD, he had secured his power and now well into adulthood, he set his sights on his father's greatest shame, their provinces in France. The English crown had never fully recovered from losing its grip on the Angevin Empire and King Henry III sought to fix that. He prepared an invasion fleet, planning to take the territories by force and re-establish English control over land he deemed his birthright. But the invasion was a disaster, perhaps on the advice of the first Earl of Kent, who had been ruling the realm on behalf of the young king while he was still coming of age, Henry avoided meeting the French in open battle and instead marched his troops across the countryside, forcing local barons and lords to pay homage to him. Some did, some didn't, and it was a pointless venture that didn't really mean much for English control in the region. Eventually, Henry was forced to return to England, having achieved nothing. As soon as Henry and his troops left France, those barons who had pledged themselves to him went right back to supporting the French king. The invasion had been a costly fiasco that made Henry extremely unpopular amongst his nobility. Hubert, first Earl of Kent, had now fallen out of favor with the king, 
and upon their return to England, Henry dismissed him, eventually imprisoning Hubert in the Tower of London. And the man chosen to replace him was no better. Peter de Roche took over as the king's justiciar and immediately set about reversing the policies of his predecessor. He stripped his enemies of land and wealth, circumventing the royal courts, and angering the nobility who believed that their rights were being infringed upon once again. Richard Marshall, the son of William Marshall, who had led the royal army in the First Barons' War, began to amass troops, only this time in support of the English barons. They argued that the king had again failed to protect their rights as outlined in the Magna Carta, and thus a new civil war broke out. Unable to gain a clear military advantage against the rebels, and with tension in France growing, King Henry had no choice. He agreed to the dismissal of Peter de Roche and submitted fully to the rebels' demands. King Henry had learned his lesson. Never again was England ruled through senior ministers, and the king now chose to administer the realm personally. The only problem was that Henry was not a good administrator. He filled the church with absentee Italian appointees and much of the civil offices with French bureaucrats, actions which unsurprisingly angered the nobility of England once more. This led to the barons to once again take action against the king. He was forced into signing the Provisions of Oxford, a document which gave barons the legal right to veto the king's decisions. Although initially supportive, King Henry tried to back out of the deal which led to the third civil war of his reign. Led by Simon de Montfort, Henry's brother-in-law, the rebel army successfully captured King Henry at the Battle of Lewis in 1265. With the king now at his mercy, Simon called the first English parliament into action. From the French word for talk, or parle, he summoned two knights from each shire and two burgesses from each borough for a discussion. The men talked and created a new system of government on the island that is still in use in England today. King Henry's eldest son, Edward Longshanks, so named for his lanky build, had been captured alongside his father at the Battle of Lewis. Shortly after the first parliamentary discussion, Edward escaped, and within a few short months he had defeated Simon at the Battle of Evesham in 1265. The Second Baron's War ended shortly after and Edward Longshanks left England with his father, King Henry, once again on the English throne. In 1275, King Henry III announced his intention to embark on the Crusades alongside his son, but died just a few months later. Edward was recalled from the continent and slowly made his way back to the English shores. Landing on the island in 1274, Edward Longshanks was crowned at Westminster Abbey shortly after becoming King of England, inheriting an island that had suffered through three major insurrections in the last 56 years. King Edward I had his work cut out for him. He immediately set about reforming royal administration and reinforcing common law, writing a series of statutes that regulated criminal and property law in the realm. Edward had also learned from his father's mistakes, and was more supportive of the demands of his nobility. He regularly convened with knights and townspeople alike on matters that affected them and quickly proved to be an able and just ruler. But despite his focus on repairing England domestically, King Edward could not help but be drawn into foreign conflicts. The first was a revolt in Wales led by a Welsh chief named Llewellyn in 1282. Here, the royal army came face to face with the brutal efficiency of the Welsh longbowmen, and despite taking heavy losses, they subdued the rebel threat. In an attempt to exert more control over the region, King Edward constructed a series of castles in the Welsh territory and increased royal presence in the region. His son, Edward, was born in Wales in 1284 and was soon after named Prince of Wales a title that the heir to the English throne still wears to this day. In 1291, another foreign conflict called his attention, this time at the northern border. Asked to arbitrate between three rival claimants to the Scottish throne, Edward chose to crown John Balliol. The only problem was that John Balliol had previously paid homage to the English king, thus ruining any impartiality Edward was supposed to have. 
This angered the Lords of Scotland, who in turn allied themselves with France, leaving England threatened on all sides. King Edward then retaliated. Claiming feudal suzerainty over Scotland, he marched his army north and invaded, defeating Balliol in 1296 and taking the Scottish crown for himself. He also took the Stone of Scone, an important relic of Scottish nobility where all Scottish kings were crowned upon. The stone is still used to crown British monarchs today and currently resides at Westminster Abbey in London. For his actions in Scotland, King Edward earned himself a new nickname. Edward Longshanks had become Edward the Hammer of Scots. Back in England, Edward was overseeing a rapidly transforming English government. He encouraged petitions to Parliament, with councils sitting much more frequently than they had previously, and he continued to clarify the responsibilities of the different courts. Criminal and Crown cases were handled by the Court of King's Bench. The Court of the Exchequer dealt with the royal finance and the Court of Common Plea handled more of the day-to-day -day cases between subjects. From these roots, a new profession sprouted – lawyers. Needing to keep his new courts running smoothly, he took the profession of law away from the clergy and formed a new social class of educated young men whose job was to learn the law away from the influence of the church. This led to the establishment of the Inns of Court, great mansions where students and barristers lived together. The barristers taught the students English common law, along with necessary social skills such as music and dancing. These inns of court also set the precedent for other collegiate systems around the country. It was during King Edward's reign that the academic system we know today as Oxford University was founded, building on the earlier schools established by Alfred the Great over 200 years before. King Edward I died of dysentery in 1307 while fighting the Scottish up north. There is a rumor that on his deathbed, Edward wished for his bones to be taken with the army while they continued their fight into Scotland. Another rumor claims that Edward wished for his heart to accompany the next crusaders as they marched into the Holy Land once more. Regardless, what these stories show is that Edward very much considered himself a warrior king. While he was a successful military commander, it was his administrative actions that had the biggest impact on England as a whole. The introduction of lawyers mingled with the burgeoning merchant class to form a proto-middle class, where before there had been none. Parliament was strengthened and legitimized during his reign, and despite his warlike tendencies, King Edward's reign was peaceful and prosperous for the average Englishman. King Edward I was succeeded by his son, Edward II, who was crowned in 1307 at Westminster Abbey. While his father had immediately launched into fixing the realm he had inherited, Edward II had no need to. His father's kingdom was flourishing, bolstered by great social changes and the newly inherited Scottish crown. It was a stable territory that was emerging as one of the most powerful kingdoms in all of Europe. But despite its power and prestige, the new King Edward appeared to almost resent the English crown that now rested on his head. He grew bored of his royal responsibilities and quickly turned his attention towards other pursuits, young men. The first of these deep infatuations the king would come to have was with Piers Gaveston. Gaveston was arrogant and well aware of his position as the king's favorite abusing his power and coming to blows with many of the other barons of England. He was a close companion to the king, accompanying him everywhere, but this wasn't well received by everyone. Soon, Gaveston's behavior angered the French royal family, to whom Edward II had married into through his wife, Isabella of France. With pressure mounting from both his nobility and the French crown, King Edward II was forced to exile Pierce Gaveston. But this didn't last long. By 1307, Gaveston was back in England and once again at the king's side. Parliament met in 1308 with the king eager to discuss potential government reform, but the barons were unwilling to proceed until the issue of Gaveston had been dealt with. The king was initially dismissive and a violent outcome seemed inevitable, but after the Archbishop of Canterbury threatened to have Gaveston excommunicated, Edward miraculously yielded. Gaveston was to be sent to Aquitaine, 
away from England for good. Unsurprisingly though, this did not last. The king once again recalled Gaveston, angering the barons and sparking an insurrection. After a period of cat and mouse between the king and the armies of his nobility, Gaveston was eventually captured at Scarborough Castle and taken to Warwick, where he was tried as a traitor. Gaveston was beheaded on the authority of the Earl of Lancaster. The king was reportedly inconsolable. Still reeling from the death of his friend, Edward was decisively defeated at the Battle of Bannockburn by Robert the Bruce, and after just 18 years of English rule, Scotland gained its independence once more in 1314. However, the king tempered his foreign losses with a new favorite, Hugh Le Dispenser. Like with Gaveston before, Dispenser and his family grew increasingly powerful as King Edward's favorites. But the barons of England had had enough. A fresh civil war broke out, which saw an army led by the Earl of Lancaster, Gaveston's killer, face off against the crown and her royal forces. After five years of bloodshed, King Edward II emerged victorious. The Earl of Lancaster got a taste of his own medicine and was beheaded at Pontefract Castle in 1326. The Dispenser clan, whose power had been growing even before the war, now saw their influence skyrocket across England. With the barons defeated, Isabella was once again forced to step in. With backing from the French crown, Queen Isabella raised an army and marched against her husband. Aided by her longtime lover Roger Mortimer, the king defeated King Edward and his army, captured Hugh Le Dispenser, and tried the young chamberlain with treason. Dispenser was, unsurprisingly, found guilty and hung, drawn, and quartered for his crimes. Fearing that her husband would once again undermine her, Queen Isabella forced King Edward II to abdicate his throne. It was decided that their son, Edward III, would take over in his place. He was only 15 when the English crown came to rest on his head, but the young king already had a big mess ahead of him to clean up. His father's unorthodox style of governance had left England in a financially precarious position, and the crown's influence had been steadily undermined by the barons who administered the lands. But before he could set about fixing his kingdom, he would have to wait to come of age. In the meantime, his mother Isabella and Roger Mortimer ruled as regents in his place. However, King Edward hated this. Mortimer held all the power, and Edward grew resentful of his mother, who always sided with her lover on courtly matters. In 1330, on the eve of his 18th birthday, King Edward III rebelled against his regents, having his mother's lover hanged and taking full control over the English crown. With power now firmly his, Edward did what most medieval kings do. He waged war. Turning his attention to the newly independent Kingdom of Scotland, he mounted a successful campaign against them crushing their army and retaking land his father had lost. But these gains were hard to hold on to, and soon a new conflict would demand all of King Edward's attention. In 1337, King Philip VI of France confiscated the English king's Duchy of Aquitaine, a move that greatly angered Edward. Instead of seeking a peaceful resolution like his father had, King Edward responded by laying claim to the French throne. He didn't know it, but this would be the start of a long and bloody conflict that would come to claim the lives of millions, outliving him and his grandsons. As the grandson of Philip IV of France, Edward did technically have a claim to the French throne. But, because of the newly set precedent of agnatic succession, which only gave the male heirs a claim to succession, Edward's link through his mother was rejected by the French courts. Regardless, King Edward III was ready to fight. After some initial setbacks, the first phase of the war went well for England. Their success at Cressy and Poitiers led to the highly favorable Treaty of Bretigny, which saw England make territorial gains on the continent but forced Edward to renounce his claim to the French throne. This was by no means a peace treaty, and fighting quickly resumed between the two kingdoms. 
But by this point, either side had other, greater problems to deal with. All of Europe, in fact, was reeling as a result of the single most deadly event in human history. In 1348, the Black Death had arrived in England. Pus-filled tumors, bile and blood, the streets of London were littered with the rotting corpses of the dead. Believed by many to be a curse from God himself, the bubonic plague claimed anywhere between one-third to half of the population of Europe in just five years. King Edward was fortunate enough to avoid contact with the disease, which spread in the cramped and overcrowded living conditions of England's major cities and decimated the normal population. The plague did more to accelerate social change than any singular event in English history before it. The unimaginably high death toll led to a labor shortage that severely impacted the English economy. With fewer hands to work the fields, many landowners were forced to enclose their lands. Switching from traditional labor-intensive crop farming to the comparatively less labor-intensive sheep herding. Raising sheep required one-fifth of the manpower, and feudal lords allowed peasants who had previously been tied to their land in a style of serfdom to purchase their freedom and leave. A new class emerged, free laborers. People who had been previously bound to an area for generations were now free to move about, and many settled in the large cities that had been devastated by the plague. This switch to sheep herding and wool farming would also transform the English economy in the coming years. But more on that later. As a result, by the end of his reign, King Edward III's kingdom looked almost unrecognizable. He had transformed England into one of the most formidable military powers in Europe, further developed legislation in the role of government, and completely revamped the economy, ushering in a golden age as England recovered from the Black Death. His 50 years on the English throne made him the longest ruling king the English throne had ever seen. But those final years were dominated by sickness and ill health. He died on the 21st of June, 1377, having outlived his own son, the Black Prince. The crown was instead passed on to Edward's grandson, Richard II. Richard was a young king, first wearing the crown at just 10 years of age, which meant like his grandfather before him, he was forced to rely on the regency of others while he came of age. John of Gaunt was the first virtual ruler to take over. He had stepped in during King Edward's final years when sickness and age kept the king bound to bed and continued to rule after King Richard's coronation in 1337. There was just one problem. Edward's long reign had by no means been easy, and by now, the cracks that had started to form previously were on the verge of entirely breaking apart. You see, the English treasury had been stretched to its limits as it struggled to keep financing the ongoing Hundred Years' War. France was larger and wealthier than England, and so had no problem pouring vast amounts of money behind their armies. Specifically during this time, there was a very real fear of a French invasion on the island, and the English army was in no position to challenge it. So, John of Gaunt introduced a new poll tax that required every person over the age of 15 to pay one shilling towards the war effort on the continent. This was not an insignificant amount of money for people at the time, and the peasantry strongly opposed the new tax. With the post-plague economic boom now firmly over, peasants had returned to low-paying work in an effort to keep food on the table. Alongside this, landowners in England had been trying to reintroduce servility and serfdom back to the land, and all these factors combined to form one major event that threatened King Richard's rule immensely. Led by the priest John Ball, a mob of 100,000 people marched on London demanding the new poll tax be abolished, a major uprising known as the Peasants' Revolt. The crowd was unruly, and within hours of their arrival in the capital, a destructive rampage broke out. The protesters burnt down the Savoy Palace, home of John of Gaunt, and even murdered the Archbishop of Canterbury. Faced with little choice, King Richard II and the Lord Mayor of London met with the demonstrators in a field just outside the city to discuss their terms. The conversation began amicably enough, 
But one of the other leaders, Watt Tyler, grew abusive and demanded more than the king and mayor would concede. Offended, the Lord Mayor of London drew his sword and killed Tyler on the spot. Fearing that the crowd would turn violent again, the young king made an extraordinarily brave move. Standing before the crowd, he shouted to the peasants to follow him, leading them away from their leader's dead body. He promised that he would enact the reforms they had insisted on and successfully disperse the crowd. These were, however, hollow promises. Immediately after the protesters had returned home, the king's council of advisors revoked any concessions made by their ruler and swiftly set about crushing the rebels. The leaders of the peasants' revolt were tried and hanged as traitors for their crimes. The king never forgot the actions of his council, and this episode ignited a deep sense of mistrust between himself and his advisors. As a result, his inner circle shrank until it only included three men, who in turn became extremely powerful due to their closeness to the king. The other nobles became resentful of this favoritism and feared that their power would soon diminish as a result. Banding together, a group of powerful lords united to form a group called the Lords Appellant. They seized control of the English government in 1387 and demanded the king expel his inner circle from court. A period of instability followed and culminated in the king being forced to banish or execute those closest to him. For the next decade, the fragile peace held, and King Richard was slowly able to re-establish royal authority and bring it away from the merciless parliament of the Lord's Appellant. In 1397, the king had amassed enough support to get his revenge. In a period that historians would come to call Richard's tyranny, the king captured, tried, and executed a number of the Appellant Lords. In 1398, Richard's tyranny went a step further as he declared all acts of the merciless parliament to be null and void. He then delegated all parliamentary power to a committee of 12 lords and 6 commoners, each chosen by the king himself, effectively making Richard an absolute ruler who no longer needed parliament's support. But there still existed a threat to Richard's rule, House Lancaster. At its head sat John of Gaunt, who represented the most powerful non-royal household on the island. King Richard had exiled John's son, Henry Boilingbroke, during his initial takeover a year before. But House Lancaster still stood in his way. Not only did they possess enormous wealth, but they were royal descendants, John being King Edward III's youngest surviving son. As a result, it was the wish of many in the land that House Lancaster would succeed a childless Richard to the English throne. Lucky for Richard though, John of Gaunt died in 1399, giving the king time to secure his power. He had John's son, Henry Boilingbroke, who he'd exiled to France, disowned, confiscating his lands and effectively stripping Boilingbroke of his claim to the throne. Feeling as though he'd effectively dealt with the Lancastrian threat, Richard turned his attention to the growing Irish problem in the West. He amassed an army of 8,000 men and left England in May 1399, landing in Dublin within the week. But just a month later, trouble on the continent spilled over into England. Charles VI, King of France, had been deposed by Louis I, and the new French king saw a chance to gain the upper hand against his English foe. In a continuation of the Hundred Years' War, Louis allowed Henry Boilingbroke to return to England with a small force, where Henry soon gathered more support and made a claim to the throne. With Richard off fighting in Ireland, Henry's arrival was entirely unchallenged. He gathered an army and soon defeated King Richard II in battle. The king was then imprisoned and later died of starvation while in the Tower of London. While Henry's claim to the throne was weak, it was unopposed by both the people and parliament, and Henry Boilingbroke was crowned Henry IV on the 30th of September, 1399. The reign of Henry IV was marked by a series of firsts. He is believed to be the first king since the Normans had invaded in 1066 to address his people in English, as opposed to Norman French. He also hosted a visit from Manuel II Palaiologos shortly after his coronation in 1400. 
making this the only time a Byzantine emperor ever visited England. In 1406, English pirates captured the future James I of Scotland, then aged 11, off the coast of Yorkshire. The young prince would remain Henry's prisoner for the rest of his reign. Aside from that though, the reign of King Henry IV was largely uneventful. He was mainly forced to deal with plots and rebellions from abroad, as well as a number of domestic assassination attempts on his life. He put down a rebellion in Wales against Owain Glyndwr in 1400, and was forced to deal with a series of rebellions led by Henry Percy, first Earl of Northumberland in the north. The Percy Rebellion, as it came to be known, ended at the Battle of Shrewsbury in 1403, where Henry's eldest son, Henry of Monmouth, showed great military prowess, leading his troops in a decisive victory against Percy's forces. During the battle, though, Henry of Monmouth was struck by an arrow to the face, but luckily survived. During the last years of his rule, the rebellions had become more frequent. A rumor soon took hold in London that Richard II, who had died of starvation in the Tower of London, was actually still alive. This was all in spite of Henry's best efforts to prove Richard had died while in captivity. King Henry had the body of Richard on display at St. Paul Cathedral shortly after his death, in an effort to prove to his supporters that the old king had in fact died, and that his death had not been violent. However, this didn't stop Scottish emissaries from traveling throughout the villages of England, declaring that Richard was alive and residing at the Scottish court. Sir Elias Livet and his associate Thomas Clark searched for an appropriate lookalike and promised him Scottish aid to carry out the insurrection. Unsurprisingly, the rebellion came to nothing. Livet was released and Clark was thrown into the Tower of London. Towards the end of his life, Henry was taken by recurring bouts of serious ill health. Henry died in London at the Abbot's House of Westminster Abbey in the Jerusalem Chamber during a convocation of Parliament. He was buried at Canterbury Cathedral adjacent to the Shrine of Thomas Becket. The English throne in its entirety would go on to his son, Henry of Monmouth. On April 9, 1413, Henry of Monmouth was crowned Henry V at Westminster Abbey. On the day of his coronation, a terrible snowstorm blew over the crowds, but the king addressed his people despite it. Described as very tall, with a slim build and a ruddy complexion, the young king had developed a taste for battle during his father's reign before him. He'd helped quash the Welsh Rebellion and personally commanded the Royal Army to victory at the Battle of Shrewsbury at just 16 years of age. But Henry V had inherited many of the same problems his father had dealt with. The Lancastrian claim had its fair share of doubters, and the young king immediately set about securing his position on the throne. He wanted to rule a unified England and not deal with the constant threat of pretenders and usurpers like his father had. He allowed his past indifferences to be forgotten, honorably reinterring the late Richard II, giving Richard's son, Edmund Mortimer, a place on the council, and gradually restoring titles and estates of those who had suffered under his father's reign. When he did face a serious threat, he proved a decisive decision maker. He ruthlessly put down the Lawler discontent in 1414 and the Southampton Plot of 1415 which involved a number of earls and barons who supported Edmund Mortimer's claim to the throne, which was easily dealt with as it failed to gain much popular support. Mortimer himself remained loyal to the king throughout the plot. He promoted the use of the English language in government, keeping records in English and using English in his personal correspondence for the first time since the Norman Conquest 350 years earlier. With his domestic situation now under control, Henry could turn his attention abroad. The Hundreds Year War was still ongoing, despite a brief period of inactivity from both sides. In 1415, King Henry V took an army and landed at Harfleur in Normandy, intent on regaining territory on the continent. After a brief siege, Henry and his men take the city of Harfleur, but it's a costly victory. It had taken Henry longer than he would have liked, and his men had suffered. Having arrived in Normandy with 12,000 men, Henry's troops now numbered only 6,000 due to desertion, starvation, and disease. 
Against the advice of his counsel, he ordered his men to march across the French countryside towards the English-held port city of Calais, where they could rearm and return to England. Unable to cross the River Somme, Henry V was forced to make a detour inland where he was intercepted by French forces near the village of Agincourt. Henry's men were exhausted. The French army outnumbered them five to one, and many of the rank and file were suffering from dysentery. Regardless, Henry had little choice but to meet the French in battle. Heavy rain the night before had made the ground around them a marshy bog, and as the astute tactician that he was, he intended to use that to his advantage. At 11 a.m., the French army attacked, mounting a cavalry charge straight at the main English line. Henry brought his archers forward and ordered them to unleash hell. With a 250-meter killing range, the English longbowmen slaughtered the French cavalry, who had been slowed down in the mud. Many were forced to dismount, and some drowned in the thick mud where they stood. By the time the cavalry reached the English line, Henry had ordered his archers to drive large, pointed stakes into the ground, a new tactic never before employed by the English against the French. The charge was rendered useless and a melee broke out. Eventually, the English archers abandoned their bows and took to fighting hand to hand. The tide of the battle quickly turned in favor of the English, who hacked the French soldiers to death, many of whom who were stuck in the mud due to their heavy armor. Before long, Henry was victorious. His army marched in Calais unopposed. When he returned to England just a few months later, he received a hero's welcome. Crowds lined the streets, pageants took place, and choirs sang in all the churches. It was a great moment of pride for England, and proved to be the greatest English victory of the Hundred Years' War. From a practical standpoint, it greatly bolstered Henry V's claim to the French throne. It directly led to infighting within the French court, and by 1420, the Treaty of Troyes was signed, acknowledging Henry as regent and heir to the French throne. By now, Henry had regained control of Normandy, was allied with the Duchy of Burgundy, and had received support from King Sigismund of Hungary, who signed the Treaty of Canterbury, acknowledging the English claim to the throne. Unification of the kingdoms of England and France seemed inevitable. It was Henry's intention that after unifying the two crowns, he would embark on a crusade. However, he died just a few years later in 1422, passing the throne onto his son, Henry VI. While Henry V's reign was short, it transformed England into a powerful player in European politics, and forged in her a new national identity. England once again had a land on the continent, and under King Henry, England reached its territorial peak in mainland Europe. Henry VI was crowned at Westminster Abbey on the 1st of September, 1422. Young kings were nothing new in the realm, but Henry VI broke every English record, ascending to the throne at just nine months old and becoming the youngest ever King of England. Still breastfeeding, the burden of administration quickly fell to regents who ruled England together. Just a few months after his coronation in England, the baby King Henry traveled to France and was crowned King of France at Notre Dame Cathedral, in accordance with the Treaty of Troyes his father had signed just a few years earlier. This made King Henry VI the only English king to also be crowned King of France in French territory. While he waited to come of age, Henry's mother Catherine remarried to Owen Tudor and had two sons, Edmund and Jasper. Henry gave his half-brothers earldoms in Normandy, and their influence would later have a huge impact on English history. By the time he reached 16, Henry had resumed full authoritative control over England. However, it came at a bad time. It was the beginning of the Great Slump a period of economic decline that would last for the next 50 years and weaken the crown's power in the realm. Things were only further complicated by the king's problematic personality. Described as shy, passive, and utterly opposed to conflict and violence, Henry VI was nothing like his father, and these traits were undesirable of a king during the medieval times and made him appear weak in court. Had he been an able administrator, he might have salvaged some respect. 
but Henry would soon prove to be unreliable in a totally different way. The king was prone to debilitating bouts of madness that forced administrative decision-making back into the hands of regents. This made England unstable and weakened royal authority. It wasn't long before England declined into anarchy and lawlessness. Disaffected nobles sensed that the crown was weak and capitalized on this, quarreling with one another and amassing private armies to fight for local supremacy. The king would intermittently resume control, but with each bout of madness that afflicted him, his grip on the realm weakened. To make matters worse, the 100 Years War that had now been raging for five generations would sputter to its end under Henry's watch. England had seen many successes and victories during its time, but by its conclusion, Henry had lost all of his father's lands in France, retaining only the port city of Calais, further adding to his image of a weak king. With his kingdom fracturing around him, it wasn't long before England broke out into civil war again. One of the more powerful noble houses had been slowly amassing support while Henry struggled to keep a grip on his sanity. House York, who claimed descendancy from Edward III, the Plantagenet king who ruled before Henry Bolingbroke took the throne by force less than 100 years ago, was preparing to make its move on the English throne. In 1460, tensions finally erupted and the War of the Roses had begun. So named for the Red Rose of Lancaster and the White Rose of York, the Yorkist rebels scoured a quick and early victory at the Battle of Northampton on the 10th of July, 1460, capturing King Henry and making him a Yorkist prisoner. The Queen, however, was able to escape, traveling through Wales and into Scotland, where she sought refuge in the court of the Scottish Queen Regent, Mary of Gelders. After amassing an army of her own, she marched back into England seeking to rescue her imprisoned husband. After defeating the Yorkist army at the Battle of Wakefield, she marched her army south to St. Albans, where the king was being held. There, she engaged with the Earl of Warwick, defeating him and freeing the king from captivity. Henry's mental state at this time was so fractured that reports state that the king laughed and sang as the battle raged around him. The Lancastrian victories were short-lived, however, as Edward of York rallied his troops and met the royal army at the Battle of Towton in 1461. Under a thick blanket of snow, the Battle of Towton became the bloodiest battle that ever took place on English soil, and resulted in a decisive Yorkist victory. Edward deposed Henry VI from the throne and hastily crowned himself King of England. Despite this, though, the war would continue as Henry fled the battle and became a fugitive in his own kingdom. Henry VI was eventually betrayed by the Black Monk of Addington and captured by Yorkist forces. The new King Edward decided to spare the Mad King's life, instead putting him in the Tower of London. Edward of York was crowned Edward IV on the 28th of June, 1461, following his victories against the Lancastrian army. As a usurper, the new king desperately needed parliamentary support to back his claim, but many of the lords in England still supported the old King Henry and chose to stay neutral during the conflict. This forced Edward to rely heavily on a small group of noblemen mainly Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick. This over-reliance would directly lead to King Edward IV losing his grip on the English crown. Warwick had advised the king to marry either Anne of France or Bona of Savoy to strengthen England's ties with France and effectively outmaneuver the Duchy of Burgundy, which had been growing in power and influence in Europe over the last decade. Edward, however, had other ideas. He married Elizabeth Woodwill, a woman of considerably lower social class than the king, and a widow, but someone who historians claim was enchanting nonetheless. This enraged Warwick, who began to seek allies elsewhere. In 1467, King Edward dealt Warwick another humiliating blow, dismissing his brother from his position as Lord Chancellor. By now, though, Warwick had amassed enough support to challenge the unpopular king. He traveled to London with an army and intended to remove the evil counselors that had taken hold of the English government. With the king preoccupied in the north, 
Neville's army was easily able to defeat the royal troops at Edgecote Moor in 1469. The king's father-in-law, Richard Woodville, alongside his youngest son Richard, were captured and executed at Kenilworth. However, it quickly became apparent that Warwick had little support in the capital, and Edward, who had been captured and imprisoned at Middleham Castle, was released and allowed to resume the throne. What followed was a period of tense stability. Warwick was ousted from Edward's courts and decided on traveling to France where he sought support from the continent and vowed to restore Henry VI, who was currently still alive in the Tower of London to the English throne. Yorkist rule had become increasingly unpopular and Warwick was able to gather an army of 30,000 men in support of his cause. Landing back in England on the 9th of September, 1470, King Edward was no match for Warwick's army, and he fled to Bruges to avoid capture. Warwick restored King Henry VI to the throne. But with this, the same problems that had plagued the Mad King's reign simply returned. Mental instability meant a lack of central leadership, and caused the nobility to fight amongst itself for power, like it had previously. Edward, meanwhile, returned to England aided by powerful Flemish merchants and immediately sought support in York. Marching through the realm, he slowly gathered an army and turned his attention to the capital. He entered London unopposed and imprisoned Henry VI once again. Warwick was killed at the Battle of Barnet in 1471, while a second Lancastrian army was defeated at the Battle of Tewkesbury only a month later. Henry's only son, Edward of Westminster, died on the battlefield, while Henry himself passed away less than a year later. With the old king and his heir dead, King Edward had hoped his throne would now be secure. But the realm was in disarray. Plagued by instability and infighting after years of civil war, King Edward was able to maintain his grip on power, but toward the end of his reign, he became increasingly ill and died on the 9th of April, 1483. His son, Edward V, was to take over as King of England. But as Edward was only little, the king named his brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, as Lord Protector and Regent while Edward came of age. But Edward would never be crowned, and England would soon discover that the new Lord Protector had little intention of vacating his position on the throne. Richard took over as Lord Protector of the Realm immediately after the death of his brother, King Edward IV. Royal records do show that plans were made for Edward V's coronation, but there is great debate among scholars as to how much of this was genuine, or merely a show put on by the new Lord Protector to appease the old King's supporters. Richard's reputation as a ruthless power grabber initially stems from the speed with which he took control of the English crown. Shortly after his appointment as Lord Protector, he brutally put down a supposed plot against his life that involved the new king's uncles, Anthony Woodville. Upon the queen's request, Richard and Anthony Woodville were to meet at Northampton and accompany the young Edward down to the capital, providing him safety and legitimacy as he ascended the throne. But while the young king waited for the arrival of his uncles, Richard got to work. He had Anthony Woodville and his associates arrested and sent to Pontefract Castle, where the men were tried and executed for an alleged plot against the new Lord Protector's life. Richard quickly notified his nephew of the treasonous actions of his uncle, and reassured the boy that they had been dealt with accordingly. He alone led Edward into London, and transferred the boy to the royal apartments in the Tower of London, as was customary for any king awaiting his coronation. But Richard's plan was only just beginning. Upon hearing the news of her brother's demise, the Dowager Queen fled to the capital and sought support from those who had been loyal to her husband. But Richard had beaten her to it. He accused those close to the Queen of being complicit in the plot against his life and had them executed within days of the trial. With the Woodville's power base in tatters, Richard had only one obstacle in between himself and the English throne the princes in the tower. As luck would have it, the Lord Protector was informed by the Bishop of Bath and Wells that King Edward IV's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville was in fact invalid. Due to King Edward still having been married to Eleanor Butler at the time of his union with Woodville, 
This meant that Edward and Richard, the princes in the tower, were illegitimate and could not rule. A sermon was preached on the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral on the day of the new king's coronation, declaring Edward V to be a bastard and asserting that Richard III was the rightful heir to the English throne. Shortly after this, the citizens of London and its nobility converged and drew up a petition asking Richard to assume direct control of the throne. On the 6th of July, 1483, Lord Protector Richard was crowned Richard III, King of England. Power was his. That same summer, the princes who had been quietly living in the tower silently disappeared. There are many theories as to what happened, from being murdered by Richard himself to fleeing to Europe under the cover of darkness. But the mystery of the princes in the tower still remains one of the greatest unsolved questions in English history. But despite the ease with which Richard had assumed the throne, his power base was still fragile, and it wasn't long before he was faced with his first major threat, the Buckingham Rebellion. Led by the Earl of Buckingham and a number of disaffected nobility who had been fiercely loyal to the old King Edward IV, they quietly planned to overthrow the new King Richard. They saw the new regime for what it was, a power grab, and they sought to give the crown back to the young Prince Edward, currently in the Tower of London. But when rumors of Prince Edward's death began to circulate throughout the realm, Buckingham had to change his plan. Luckily for him, there was another candidate ready and willing just to cross the channel, Henry Tudor. As the son of Lady Margaret Beaufort, herself a descendant of King Edward III, Henry had a legal claim to the English throne, regardless of how weak it actually was. Buckingham gathered his troops in Wales while Henry Tudor, who had been exiled to France, gathered an army on the continent. However, just like it had in 1066, Bad weather once again played an important part in the fate of England, as Henry and his ships were delayed crossing the English Channel by a fierce storm. Most of his fleet was forced to turn back to their ports in Normandy and Calais, while Henry himself anchored at Plymouth to wait out the gale. Buckingham's army was troubled by the same storm on land, and when Richard's troops arrived to face the rebel army, many of Buckingham's men deserted leaving the Earl to be captured, tried, and beheaded in Salisbury. When Henry heard of Buckingham's fate, he fled to Paris, where the French regent supplied him with a fresh army with which to invade a year later in 1485. On the 22nd of August, the armies of Henry Tudor and King Richard III met at Bosworth Field near the city of Leicester. Accounts of the battle claim that the King's forces heavily outnumbered that of the Tudor rebel. But as Richard was about to discover, who he had with him was about to become far more important than how many he had with him. King Richard divided his army into three main units. One section would be led by the Duke of Norfolk, the other by the Earl of Northumberland, while Richard himself would take control of the bulk of the army. The battle began with King Richard attacking Henry Tudor's forces head on. The melee was brutal and fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat broke out. But Henry's army was well drilled and led by the Earl of Oxford, an incredibly competent military strategist. Despite a numerical disadvantage, the Earl was able to inflict serious casualties on the royal army, causing some of the Duke of Norfolk's troops to flee the battle. It was at this moment that Richard turned to Northumberland and signaled for the Earl to reinforce his lines. But Northumberland refused. Meanwhile, on a hill overlooking the battle, Sir William Stanley, son of the Earl of Stanley, had arrived with his army. He had been loyal to Richard and the Yorkist regime since the start of the War of Roses 30 years ago. Stanley had been present at the Battle of Tewkesbury when Edward IV took the throne, and Richard had even rewarded him after his ascension to power with land in North Wales. But this meant little to Stanley, who held off on joining either side until a clear winner had emerged. With Northumberland refusing to come to his aid, Richard feared that he might lose control of his army soon. So he mounted a risky attack, intending to charge right into Henry's forces and kill the young pretender himself, ending the battle and securing a victory. But seeing the king separated from his main army, Stanley made a decision that changed the course of English history. He joined on the side of Henry Tudor, surrounding King Richard and his men and removing the king from his horse. My horse, my horse, 
a kingdom for my horse, the king shouted as he fought bravely surrounded by swarms of his enemies. King Richard reportedly came within a sword's length of Henry Tudor before finally being overwhelmed by Stanley and his men. He was killed where he stood. The Battle of Bosworth Field was over and the reign of Richard III had ended. He would be the last English king to die in battle. Myth has it that the English crown was found propped up against a bush nearby. It was taken and placed on Henry Tudor's head right there on the battlefield. Richard's body was buried without ceremony in a nearby abbey in Leicester. His death marked the official end of the War of Roses, and Richard III became the last Plantagenet king to rule over the island. After over three decades of civil war, England had a new king. Henry Tudor was crowned Henry VII at Westminster Abbey on the 30th of October, 1485. His ascension marks the beginning of the early modern period of English history. As a king by right of conquest, Henry faced the difficult challenge of consolidating his power and securing his position on the throne. He did this by marrying Elizabeth of York, daughter of Edward IV, and uniting the warring houses of Lancaster and York together to form the new house Tudor. He punished those loyal to the old king and rewarded any man who swore fealty to him, promising not to confiscate their lands or remove their royal titles. Many welcomed the change in leadership and pledged their support to the Tudor king. Once his position as ruler was more secure, he turned his attention to repairing the kingdom he had won, and England was in serious need of repair. Decades of civil war and two usurpations in the last three years had left the realm in serious administrative and financial disarray. But thankfully, King Henry proved to be the right man for the job. The new king believed in something called royal absolutism, essentially the divine right of kings to rule as they saw fit without having to answer to nobility, church, or parliament. This led Henry to take a much more hands-on approach to the everyday running of his kingdom. He was a stickler for details and quickly proved himself to be a highly capable administrator and diplomat. Up first was the crown's finances. Civil wars are never great for the treasury, and after 30 years of fighting on top of the great slump that had only ended five years before his ascension, England's financial situation was in tatters. He revitalized the exchequer and improved tax collection in the realm by keeping the same financial advisors throughout his entire reign. This gave the office of the exchequer a strong sense of stability and allowed the men to refine their processes. He was also far less extravagant than his predecessors, choosing to be fiscally responsible instead of spending lavishly on feasts and events. He introduced the Acts of Resumption in 1486, which gave him access to all the lands given away during the War of the Roses, and placed them directly under the crown's control, greatly improving his financial situation. But perhaps his greatest economic achievement was the Magnus Intercursus, or the Great Agreement. As you might remember, a few generations ago, England had switched from majority crop farming to sheep tending. Now, centuries later, the English wool trade had exploded and become the island's main economic export into Europe. But that export was directly threatened when Margaret of Burgundy supported Perkin Warbeck, a pretender to the throne and one of the first major rebellions Henry was forced to deal with during his reign. The king enacted a trade embargo with Burgundy, cutting off their supply of wool and severely limiting the amount of English trade that was going into the continent. But wool was an important material, and English wool was prized from Paris to Rome, so it wasn't long before the two nations began talks of negotiation. What emerged was the Magnus Intercursus, a treaty which reopened trade between the two countries, but heavily favored England as it removed the taxation of English goods going into Europe, making the island rich in the process. And speaking of pretenders, Henry had two major uprisings during his reign. The first was Lambert Simnel, a young boy who had been somewhat forced into pretending to be one of the young princes in the tower. After his army was defeated, King Henry showed great mercy in sparing the boy's life, giving him a job in his kitchens for the remainder of his existence. The next was Perkin Warbeck, 
a more serious threat as he gained support from Margaret of Burgundy and gathered an invasion force to invade the island. Warbeck too was defeated, but unlike Lambert Simnel, he did not escape a gruesome death. He was hung alongside his supporters. In all, King Henry VII's reign was a remarkably peaceful and prosperous time. He was a fantastic and able administrator and ruled for a long 24 years where the crown's influence and control grew alongside her treasury. The realm welcomed the stability King Henry brought and his legitimacy was never seriously questioned or challenged. But the later years of his reign were marked by personal tragedy. He lost his eldest son Arthur to the English sweating sickness and was reportedly stricken with grief. The normally stoic and reserved king could apparently be heard sobbing at the loss of his son. A year later, he lost his wife, Queen Elizabeth, and reportedly locked himself away for weeks, speaking to no one. Many of his courtiers note that King Henry never truly recovered after the death of his wife. He died on the 21st of April, 1509, and was succeeded by his son, Henry, Duke of York. There is a strong argument to be made that there is no English king more famous than Henry VIII. An ironic sentiment when you consider he was never actually meant to be king. King Henry VII's eldest son was Arthur, Prince of Wales. Born in 1486, he spent his life training in the royal courts and being groomed to take over from his father before him. His younger brother Henry, meanwhile, was raised as a prince with little responsibility, hunting, drinking, and competing. These were the pursuits Henry occupied himself with during his childhood, and he was more than happy to watch his brother take the throne. At just 15 years old, Arthur was married to Catherine of Aragon, daughter of the powerful Catholic monarchy in Spain, uniting the two kingdoms as one. However, just six months after his marriage to Catherine, the newlyweds came down with a bad case of sweating sickness. Catherine survived, while Arthur unfortunately perished, leaving the throne to fall to his younger brother Henry. History has not been kind to Henry VIII, and the Tudor king is often remembered for two main things. His six wives and his break from the Catholic Church. He is often portrayed as large, bordering on obese, rude, mad, and wholly uncultured, a stark contrast to how Henry was actually perceived during his life. He was a natural athlete, a talented musician, religious and well-learned, traits which made the young King Henry extremely popular in court and to the other rulers of Europe. But while Henry may have impressed in court, he was not an able statesman by any means. He had zero interest in administration and was considerably less frugal than his father, which unsurprisingly resulted in the vastly filled treasuries being depleted of gold by the end of his reign. Henry had a council who listened to him due to his willingness to kill. The council fulfilled their duties. Sir Thomas More, a member of the council, served Henry, though the two became very close friends. Seeking to unload the burden of administration, King Henry put Cardinal Wolsey in charge of England. The son of a Suffolk wool merchant, Wolsey was a shrewd diplomat and was able to keep England afloat, despite the king's best efforts to bankrupt her. Wolsey's rise through the ranks of the clergy was unparalleled, from Bishop of London to Archbishop of York, and then Cardinal and Lord Chancellor of England to finally Papal Legate himself. Wolsey was one of the most successful new men of his generation. There were even serious considerations to make Wolsey Pope. Scholars believe that part of the reason Wolsey was eventually passed on for Pope was because of the role England was playing during the Reformation. Europe as a whole was undergoing major religious upheaval, where many religious scholars and academic thinkers were challenging the established ideas of the church. It was called the Reformation, and many of these reformers called England their home. They believed the church had become corrupt. But it's important to note, King Henry's break from the Catholic Church had nothing to do with his support for the Reformation. Henry was in fact a religious conservative, and his break from the Catholic Church was wholly selfish and for personal gain only. You see, after the death of his brother, Henry had received special dispensation from the Pope to marry his brother's widow, thanks to the fact that their marriage had never been consummated. For a long time, the pair were happily married, but as the years wore on, a problem soon became evident. 
Henry desperately wanted a male heir, and after 24 years of marriage to Catherine of Aragon, they had produced only one child, Mary. This led the king's eyes to wander, and they quickly landed on Anne Boylan, one of the queen's ladies-in-waiting. Anne Boylan refused Henry's advances and insisted that if he wanted her, he would need to marry her. Henry turned to his expert chancellor, Cardinal Wolsey. Wolsey had the unenviable task of asking the Pope if he would annul the king's marriage to Catherine. The Pope denied it. Henry was furious, and looking for someone to blame, he fired Wolsey from his post and accused him of treason. Wolsey was saved from a long and humiliating trial as he died shortly after his deposition. Henry soon found himself in a race against time. Anne had fallen pregnant, and the king was certain she was carrying a boy. As he was still married to Catherine, any child born from another woman would be illegitimate and unable to succeed him as heir. Knowing the Pope was unsympathetic to his cause, he turned to Parliament forcing them to declare his first marriage void. He married Anne in secret, and their child was born soon after. To Henry's dismay, however, it was a girl, the future Elizabeth I. Henry's actions greatly angered not just the clergy, but the Spanish Kingdom of Aragon, sparking a conflict that would come to have serious consequences on England in the coming decades. As his relationship with the Pope had soured, Henry decided to take matters into his own hands. In 1534, the Acts of Supremacy was passed, making Henry, not the Pope, head of the Church of England. But how was Henry able to pull this off? Rome had been the head of the English Church since the time of the great Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Put simply, the Reformation. The Church had incurred a tremendous amount of bad feeling from everyone in England, with Church officials being seen as wealthy, corrupt, and removed from the ordinary man. With Henry now at the head of the Church of England, he was free to do as he pleased. Those who disagreed would be killed. Henry asserted the greatest power when he had Thomas More beheaded for refusing to take the oath of succession. It didn't matter who you were, Henry would punish. Henry VIII deeply regretted the killing. It was his one life regret. After Anne Boylan failed to provide Henry with the male heir he wanted, Henry believed she was having an affair with her brother. He had both of them charged with treason and beheaded. He married Jane Seymour next, a woman of considerably lower education than his previous two marriages, but someone he was deeply fond of. She was successful in giving Henry a male heir, Edward. But the boy was sickly, and there were serious doubts about his ability to make it into adulthood, so Henry kept trying. Jane Seymour died of postnatal complications a few weeks after the birth of Edward, and the heartbroken king mourned her loss heavily. In 1540, however, he was persuaded to marry Anne of Cleves. But Anne wasn't exactly what you'd call a looker, and their bond lasted only a year before Henry had that marriage annulled too. That same year, he married the 19-year-old Catherine Howard, cousin of the late Anne Boylan. She too was beheaded. His final wife, Catherine Parr, had the luxury of being widowed by the 55-year-old Henry, who died in 1547. He was buried at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle, beside the remains of his third wife, Jane Seymour. His reign had been described as one of the most important in English history. Henry VIII died believing he had achieved what he'd wanted all along, a male heir on the English throne. But as we'll soon find out, his actions were about to plunge England into a period of instability and destruction that would lead to the death of all but one of his children. Crowned on the 20th of February, 1547, Edward was just nine when he came to the throne and thus saw his kingdom ruled by a regency council led by his uncle Edward Seymour. The youngest of Henry's three children, Edward was the first English king raised completely Protestant, and his reign was marked by major economic and religious upheaval. The former was very much a gift from his father, Henry VIII, who spent and squandered the vast wealth of the crown through excessive flamboyance and mismanagement. Things were not helped by a costly and ineffective war Edward VI waged against Scotland which ended in peace in exchange for the withdrawal of troops from Scottish territory and northern France. But perhaps most impactful was the immense religious change England soon found itself under. 
While Henry had broken away from the Catholic Church, he still remained fervently Catholic in doctrine, upholding its traditions and practices throughout the realm. But King Edward, meanwhile, was raised a total Protestant and under the regency of the Lord Protector Seymour, vast and sweeping religious reforms were passed in England. Staples of the Catholic Church, like Mass and clerical celibacy, were abolished, and Seymour passed the Acts of Uniformity, which forced all people in the realm to attend worship on Sunday. While a little tyrannical, it did introduce the concept of Sunday as a mandatory day off for the English peasantry. But while regents ruled in his place, King Edward VI struggled with his health. He was feeble, ghostly pale, and constantly sickly. In 1553, Edward fell ill and died. He was only 15 years old. Before his death, he, alongside his council, devised a plan for succession. Childless, Edward wanted to ensure that his kingdom remained Protestant and so passed his crown onto his first cousin and granddaughter of Henry VII, Lady Jane Grey. This action, however, removed his older sisters Mary and Elizabeth from the line of succession. Mary was a devout Catholic and would no doubt have reversed many of Edward's reformist policies. As is the case often with royal succession, Edward's passing on the 6th of July brought chaos to England. Lady Jane Grey never had a coronation. She struggled to gain support outside the royal courts, and after just nine days on the throne, she was removed by Mary I, Henry's eldest daughter from his first marriage to Catherine of Aragon. Amassing an army in East Anglia, Mary marched on London and deposed Jane, beheading her for treason and taking the English throne as her own. Excluding the contested reigns of Lady Jane Grey and Empress Matilda, Queen Mary was the first Queen Regent of England. But while Mary was able to wrestle control of the crown back from her Protestant cousin, England's foothold on Calais would finally be lost, ending centuries of English presence on the continent of Europe. For now, England was once again just an island. Edward's fear that his half-sister would try to undo most, if not all of his religious reforms, was confirmed shortly after she came to power. As a devout Catholic, Mary disliked Protestantism, seeing it as one of the vehicles that led to her mother's humiliation and her own disownment. During her reign, Protestants were severely repressed and many were burnt at the stake as heretics, earning the queen a new name, Bloody Mary. But conflict with the Protestants wasn't enough for Mary, as she soon became diametrically opposed with her own parliament. It was Parliament who stopped many of Mary's counter-reforms against Protestantism from becoming law, something she was greatly angered by. She entered into an extremely unpopular marriage with Philip of Spain, himself a devout Catholic, but was blocked by Parliament from making him co-ruler of England, essentially barring him from taking over the throne should Mary die before him. The pair never had any children, and in 1558, Queen Mary I fell gravely ill. It was obvious that she would soon die. As Parliament blocked Philip from inheriting the English throne, the crown was to be passed on to Mary's younger sister and the last person on earth who thought she would inherit the English crown, Elizabeth. The pendulum swing of religious reformation that had gripped England since the reign of Henry VIII once again shifted towards the side of Protestantism with the ascension of Elizabeth as ruler. She was crowned Queen Elizabeth I on the 17th of November, 1558. Unlike her siblings before her, Elizabeth possessed a keen eye for diplomacy and a shrewd political mind. She knew that to remain in power, she would need both the support of Parliament and the religious bodies of England. Under Queen Elizabeth, the Church of England as we know it today was officially established in 1563. It based its dogma on the Protestant belief system, but the liturgy, rites, and organization were very much still Catholic in form, appeasing both sides and somewhat calming the volatile Reformation, for now. However, religion still posed a great threat to the new queen, as she soon faced a Catholic uprising from the north, led by her cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots. As the granddaughter of Henry VII, Mary made a claim to the English throne, actions which many of the Catholics in England wholeheartedly supported. 
Queen Elizabeth felt threatened by Mary and her growing power base, but was initially reluctant to take direct action against her. She settled for imprisoning Mary in the Tower of London. But during her imprisonment, it was discovered that she was in regular correspondence with many of the Queen's enemies. Elizabeth had no choice. Mary, Queen of Scots, was executed for treason in 1587. Soon, however, her attention would be turned away from domestic matters and onto more international threats. England's relationship with Spain had slowly been souring since the reign of her father. Angered by the treatment of Catherine of Aragon, and further angered by the treatment of Mary's husband Philip of Spain, relations between the two European superpowers was at an all-time low. Spain was still firmly Catholic. Meanwhile, England spearheaded the new Protestant Reformation that was sweeping over Europe. But the catalyst which finally ignited war between the two nations was the New World. Discovered by Christopher Columbus in 1492, the Spanish crown had been made rich thanks to the influx of new materials and minerals from its territories in the New World. As England's own empirical ambitions had yet to fully begin, they resorted to piracy. English sailors would raid Spanish frigates traveling across the Atlantic, stealing their wealth and bringing it back to England. Publicly, Elizabeth denounced those pirates, but in private she supported and even praised them for their actions, knighting prominent privateers, as they were called, like Sir Francis Drake and Sir John Hawkins. By 1588, Spain had had enough. They amassed a large fleet of ships with the intention of invading England. Dubbed the Spanish Armada, it left Lisbon with over 150 ships and 18,000 men at their control. At the time, it was the largest fleet ever seen in Europe, and was widely considered to be invincible. It easily outnumbered and outgunned the English fleet, and with news of its departure, fear set in at Westminster. The Armada was sighted off the coast of Plymouth, where English commander Sir Francis Drake was enjoying a calm game of bowls. Legend has it that Drake insisted on finishing his game before meeting his enemy in battle. The English ships sailed out to meet the Armada, and light skirmishes began off the Cornish coast. English used its smaller and faster ships to outmaneuver the large and bulky Spanish fleet, inflicting some early damage on the invading navy. Following the Armada up into the Channel, the Spanish commander in charge of the fleet was advised to stop and occupy the Isle of Wight but refused and instead continued on with his planned rendezvous with the Duke of Parma's forces in Flanders. They reached Calais largely intact, but that night, things were about to change. Knowing he could not beat the Spanish in an open battle, Drake devised a plan. They set entire ships alight and sailed them into the Spanish fleet anchored at Calais, causing the fleet to scatter and take heavy losses. The Spaniards suffered another defeat at the hands of the smaller English ships at the Battle of Gravelines, and as the Armada fled up into the North Sea, English ships gave chase around the island. Now firmly in the North Sea, Drake and his navy gave up chasing the Spanish fleet and returned home. The ships that remained of the Armada now had the long journey back to Lisbon. A huge and violent storm erupted while the Spanish sailed around Scotland and many ships were shipwrecked. By the time they returned to Spain, the mighty Armada was in pieces. Drake was a hero, and England was safe. The reign of Elizabeth was an incredibly transformative time in English history. It marked the emergence of England as a global power, and not just a European one. The investment into a royal navy led directly to England's colonial ambitions in the years that followed. A cultural renaissance also took hold of the island. Great playwrights like Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe packed theaters in the capital, while adventurers like Drake and Walter Raleigh explored a new world beyond the borders of Europe. Her 44 years on the throne was welcomed by all, and Queen Elizabeth enjoyed great popularity amongst her subjects. One of her most defining features was her chastity. Elizabeth died a virgin in 1603. She never married, never publicly took suitors, and as a result, had no heirs. She was the last Tudor monarch of England. The issue of succession loomed large in Elizabeth's later years, but before she died, an agreement had been reached that the throne would pass on to her cousin, James VI of Scotland, son of Mary Queen of Scots. 
This unified England and Scotland peacefully under one banner for the first time in its history and laid the foundation for the Kingdom of Great Britain that was about to take its place as a superpower on the world stage. On the 24th of March, 1603, James VI of Scotland was crowned James I, King of England. It's worth noting that while James was ruler of both England and Scotland, the two kingdoms were not a unified entity. They still had separate parliaments, their own laws, and individual judiciaries. King James was just a shared head of state. But it was the first step towards the unification of the island of Great Britain. And King James spent most of his rule fighting to unify the two administrative bodies. Despite this, however, the reign of the first Stuart King would mostly be remembered for its conflict and division. Religion still dominated English domestic policy, and the king continued to support the Protestants and their reformation that firmly took hold in England. During the early years of his rule, the king had a new version of the Bible commissioned. Named the King James Bible, it was an English-language Bible that soared in popularity thanks to its poetic prose and vivid imagery. Many historians credit it for helping to spread the English language across the globe, as it quickly became the most printed book ever, and still remains a popular version of the Bible today. In 1604, he expelled all Catholic priests from the island a move that would spark an explosive reaction from the increasingly radical Catholic minority which still called England their home. One wet and dark evening in Northamptonshire, eleven men quietly murmured to one another at a nearby inn. Bathed in candlelight and gripped by religious fervor, they devised a plan to put an end to the Protestant Reformation and its supporters. They would take 36 barrels of gunpowder into the cellars of the newly constructed Houses of Parliament and ignite them on the day the building was to open, killing the king and his council in a bang of smoke and fire. It was to be known as the Gunpowder Plot. Over the course of a few weeks, they rolled their barrels down, avoiding deduction and capture night after night. With the grand opening set for the 5th of November and the gunpowder ready to blow, all the plotters had to do was wait. But their plans failed. An anonymous letter betrayed the plotters, and on the morning of the grand opening, royal guards flooded into the cellars to discover a lone man standing amidst the barrels of gunpowder. Guy Fox was caught and arrested. He was brutally tortured for several days, finally giving away the identities of the other conspirators after three days on the rack. The gunpowder plotters were rounded up, captured, and executed. All around London, people lit bonfires in celebration of the foiled attack on Parliament and the King. This tradition still exists in England today. The plotters had hoped their attack would stop the Reformation in its tracks, but in fact, it had the opposite effect. King James had once promised not to persecute Catholics as long as they be quiet and give but an outward obedience to the law. After the failed gunpowder plot, however, he passed a wave of anti-Catholic legislation, and many in Parliament who had remained decidedly neutral on the Reformation now firmly supported the Protestant cause. But for all the religious strife in the realm, King James's biggest threat actually came from within. Parliament had been growing increasingly powerful, and at the start of the 1600s, their influence in the kingdom was at an all-time high. In 1614, he commented that he was surprised his ancestors should have permitted such an institution to come into existence. It is sedation in subjects to dispute what a king may do in the height of his power. Like many before him, King James believed in the absolute power of the monarchy, and as a result, resented Parliament's ability to challenge and contest his rule. But while they may have had their differences, both ruling bodies were able to compromise and maintain the peace. As a result, the reign of King James I was widely considered to be a peaceful and prosperous time in England. The English crown established its first colony in the New World, Jamestown in Virginia, so named after King James and the Virgin Queen Elizabeth before him. Meanwhile, the great literary tradition of English writers continued to flourish as England became a center for culture and art in Europe. 
By the end of his life, King James suffered from ill health brought on by a lifestyle of excesses. He would eventually die during a strong bout of dysentery on the 27th of March, 1625. At his funeral, it was remarked that the king died as he lived, in peace. But cracks in the kingdom had started to show. Too long had England labored under the strains of parliamentary conflict and religious upheaval. The heir to the English throne, Charles I, was about to inherit a realm that was on the verge of tearing itself apart. Crowned on the 27th of March, 1625, Charles I became King of England, Scotland, and Ireland in front of a large crowd at Westminster Abbey. He shared in his father's ideas of a monarch's divine right to rule, and as such, was determined to limit the power of Parliament and govern over England unchecked and unquestioned. Their first showdown came in 1627 when King Charles attempted to levy taxes without parliamentary backing. Parliament responded with the Petition of Rights a year later. Its basic premise was that no taxes of any kind could be allowed without the permission of Parliament. For Charles, this was the final straw. He dissolved Parliament and ruled without it for the next 11 years, levying a number of dubious taxes and passing new laws without parliamentary backing, actions which made the English king extremely unpopular. During this time, England saw an unprecedented level of emigration from the island. It is estimated that up to 60,000 people left England, with half of them going to the new American colonies across the Atlantic. It wasn't only because of the unjust and steep taxation levied by King Charles, but because they sought religious freedom in the New World. The Calvinist movement had become increasingly popular in the kingdom, especially amongst the middle and lower classes, and given rise to Puritanism. Puritans believed that the new Church of England wasn't Protestant enough in its practices, and thought it needed to further separate itself from Catholic doctrine which still permeated some aspects of its worship. Because of the increasing amount of Protestant offshoots that were springing up, Archbishop Laud attempted to impose uniformity on the English church, opposing the Puritan ideal of a stripped-back ceremony in favor of a traditional ceremonial splendor, similar to that of the Roman Catholics. As a result, a vast majority of the people who left for the colonies were Puritans who wished to practice religion the way they saw fit, but the impact of King Charles's taxes should not be understated. He attempted to levy ship money, a form of taxation that previously only applied to port cities, but now applied to the entire country, leading to a sharp decline in his popularity and firm opposition to the royal regime. Angry at the lack of support and desperate for money, King Charles had no choice but to call Parliament. The short parliament, as it came to be known, sat for just three weeks. It came to an abrupt end after parliament refused to vote on any new taxes until the king had listened to their long list of grievances. After a rebellion broke out in Scotland just months later, Charles was once again forced to call parliament. This time, parliament would sit for 20 years, earning itself the nickname the Long Parliament. It was apparent to all that King Charles's power was growing weaker by the day and Parliament seized on the opportunity to make increasingly larger demands, all of which the King refused. The fractured and tense relationship between the King and his Parliament that had been festering since the reign of King James I finally caved in. Fighting broke out in 1642, marking the beginning of the English Civil War. It was a conflict that was largely split up along class lines. Parliamentary troops, or roundheads as they were known, were largely made up of the Protestant middle class. Meanwhile, the king's army, or the cavaliers, were mainly supported by the nobility, clergy, and peasantry. The war began as a series of indecisive skirmishes across the region. It was during this time that a parliamentary general from East Anglia began to make a name for himself in the roundhead army. Oliver Cromwell rose to prominence by organizing the irregular parliamentary troops and transforming them into a disciplined, new model army capable of taking on the king. But while conflict raged for the fate of the kingdom, life for most during the Civil War went on as usual. Few were involved and even fewer knew about the fighting, 
In 1644, a farmer at Marston Moor was told to leave because the armies of Parliament and the armies of the King were preparing to fight on his land. He responded by saying, What? Has them two fallen out then? The farmer was probably equally unaware that the farmland he tilled at Marston Moor was to be a turning point in the war. King Charles's army was decisively beaten by Cromwell and his men, earning Parliament the first major victory of the conflict and gave them direct control over the north of England. A year later, the king and his army was once again defeated at the Battle of Naseby, losing control of the south of England as well. The English Civil War was over. Parliament had won. Marching back into London, they sought peace with the king. During the conflict, however, the parliamentary cause became increasingly radicalized and extreme in their Protestant beliefs. Archbishop Laud, who had pushed back many of the Calvinist reforms, was executed in 1645, and many within Parliament called for the execution of the King as the only way to prevent the nation falling into anarchy again. In 1649, King Charles was brought to trial in Westminster. The King was unyielding and stubbornly stuck to his absolutist beliefs, refusing every one of Parliament's calls for reform. The radical core had had enough. Charged with treason by a parliament whose authority he refused to acknowledge, King Charles I was executed in Whitehall on the 30th of January, 1649. For the first time since the Roman Republic, England was ruled in its entirety by a council of representative officials and not a divine ruler. England had become a commonwealth. The King's execution was actually delayed by several hours so that the House of Commons could pass an emergency bill that declared itself the source of all just power in the realm. The reality of the situation was very different. Almost all power was in the hands of one man, Oliver Cromwell. He'd proven himself a highly capable military leader and retained control of the parliamentary army even after the war had ended. King Charles' son, Charles II, landed in Scotland shortly after his father's death and attempted to invade England through the north. Cromwell defeated his army at Worcester in 1650, and Charles was forced to flee to France. Back in London, Parliament was struggling to agree on how the realm should be governed. Cromwell, growing tired of the unending debates, dissolved the rump Parliament with the use of his armed forces. In 1653, he established the Protectorate, an executive council that would directly rule over England just like the king had before. You can probably guess who he installed as its leader. A king in all but name, Cromwell ruthlessly enforced a set of rigid and strict laws that followed the Puritan ideal unwaveringly. Church attendance was compulsory, horse racing and cockfighting were banned, gambling dens and brothels closed down, and Cromwell even cancelled Christmas. It wasn't long before the Lord Protector had become as autocratic as the king he'd overthrown. He called Parliament when he wanted to raise taxes, and dismissed it when they argued. In all, it was a time of great repression and prudence. Pursuits of pleasure were banned, and many in the realm longed for the days when kings ruled England. Cromwell eventually died on the 3rd of September, 1658, and was buried at Westminster Abbey, a luxury previously only afforded to kings and queens of England. There were attempts to have his son, Richard Cromwell, take over the post of Lord Protector, but Richard was a less impactful character than his father, and as such he was ousted shortly after taking the post. The Commonwealth had become so unpopular during Cromwell's rule that after his death, the people called for the king to be reinstated. Charles II came back from exile and was re-crowned King of England on the 29th of May, 1661. The body of Oliver Cromwell was exhumed from its grave at Westminster and hung at Tyburn for all to see. When he began to rot, his head was cut off and put on public display outside Westminster Hall for the next 20 years. A statue of Cromwell still stands at the foot of the Houses of Parliament today. The Commonwealth and its protectorate had a profound impact on English society. Puritanism became inexorably linked with military rule and from this point onwards, the more Puritan aspects of the Reformation were staunchly opposed by Parliament as the fervor of religion began to take a back seat in domestic rule. 
It also strengthened the bond between the kingdom and its king. In the next centuries, while Europe burned in the crucible of revolution, England remained a staunch supporter of dynastic rule. But more on that later. Considerably less hard-headed than his father, King Charles II oversaw the restoration of the crown and the reintroduction of the royal family in England. The new king agreed to many of the proposals his predecessor had fought so hard against, and the relationship between king and parliament improved considerably. King Charles II then set about reverting many of the strict Puritan laws that Cromwell had passed during his protectorship. Alehouses were reopened, theaters were allowed to put on shows again, and sports and dance were revived throughout the region. But for all the splendor and merry that King Charles II oversaw, fresh challenges awaited as the kingdom settled back into its familiar rhythms. The English navy was at an all-time low, having just lost the Second Anglo-Dutch War that saw the Netherlands retain their position as the dominant European trader on the high seas. Back at home, the Great Plague had struck London, killing an estimated 70,000 people and decimating the already dwindling English population. The following year, the Great Fire of London burned through the capital, leaving as much as 450 acres of London real estate in ash and soot. While the fire killed many and destroyed the livelihoods of thousands of Londoners, it did bring about the end of the Great Plague as all the infected rats burned in the inferno. Moreover, it gave the king a chance to rebuild parts of the old, run-down, and ancient city. Houses were rebuilt with high-quality materials. Civil planning was introduced, widening streets, and making the capital feel less cramped. The old St. Paul's Cathedral also needed to be rebuilt, giving us the stunning architectural masterpiece we still have today. Huge changes in government were also beginning to take shape. During the reign of King Charles II, there was a move to the cabinet style of government England still uses today. Political parties were formed that became the forerunners to the Tories and Whigs. England was modernizing at a rapid rate, spurred on by the new king and the restoration of the monarchy. It was considered to be a model nation and despite its flaws, it truly was leading the way in Europe in terms of freedom and quality of life. But for all modernization, religion still plagued domestic policy in the kingdom. There was an apparent plot to kill the king and establish Catholicism in England once again. Known as the Popish Plot of 1678, it highlighted how Catholics in the realm still severely opposed the Reformation, its ideals, and the king's perceived role in all this. As a result of the plot, anti-Catholic sentiment soared and Catholics were banned from Parliament for the first time in the nation's history. Despite this though, King Charles was considerably more popular than his father before him and was considered something of a modern man. He was affable, friendly, and reportedly very easygoing. His court quickly developed a reputation for being morally lax and the king was often criticized for being overly reserved especially in political matters. His marriage to Catherine of Braganza saw the pair produce no surviving heirs, but the king did recognize 12 illegitimate children to various mistresses. As a result, when King Charles II died on the 6th of February 1684, the throne had to be passed on to his brother, James. James was crowned James II of England on the same day of his brother's passing in 1684. He was a staunch Catholic, and despite the growing anti-Catholic sentiment that defined England during this time, he was accepted as king. But while Parliament may have been accepting of his personal Catholic persuasion, they were far less tolerant of any supporting legislation. King James tried unsuccessfully to enact a number of pro-Catholic policies in the realm. This quickly turned the two political parties that had formed, the Whigs and Tories, against him, and the king grew increasingly more isolated by the day. In 1685, one of Charles's illegitimate sons, the Duke of Monmouth, landed in Somerset and launched a rebellion against his uncle, supported by local farmers and laborers in the region. The Pitchfork Rebellion was a short-lived affair that ended with the Battle of Sedgemoor, 
the last battle on English soil and culminated in the Bloody Assizes, a series of brutal trials that punished all those who had supported the rebellion. Led by the infamous Judge Jeffreys, hundreds of men were condemned to their death and the king's popularity in the realm plummeted. To make matters worse, King James had recently had a son and shored up his line of succession with a Catholic heir. Parliament feared a new Catholic line of succession in England and acted quickly to stop this. They invited the firmly Protestant William and Mary of Orange from modern-day Holland to take over the English throne from King James II. Amassing an army, William led the Glorious Revolution in 1688, landing Brixham and deposing King James II unopposed. The old king fled to France where he was welcomed by Louis XIV and given a small court of his own where he could live out the rest of his days in quiet and comfort. Now, it's important to note that William of Orange and his wife Mary of England were by no means usurpers of the English throne. Mary was actually King James's eldest daughter, while William was a descendant of Charles I. This legally meant William and Mary had as much claim to the throne as, say, James himself. But bloodlines aside, what really made the pair such an attractive prospect was their firm belief in Protestantism. William of Orange was widely considered a champion of the faith, having led multiple wars against the powerful Catholic King Louis XIV on the continent. Together with his wife Mary, they ruled over England together as co-regents. But in reality, King William spent a majority of his time in Europe fighting the Nine Years' War. This left Queen Mary II to rule over the realm alone in his absence. She quickly proved to be an exemplary regent, ruling with a firmness and speed, all of which made her popular with her parliament and people. For the first time since the reign of Queen Elizabeth, the two governing bodies that ruled over England enjoyed a period of considerable peace and cooperation. Parliament was able to pass new bills and levy taxes with little royal pushback. And in 1689, they passed the Bill of Rights, a landmark moment in English history that forever altered the power of the crown. It essentially banned all Catholics from being crowned king or queen of England again, and also barred the regent from interfering with political matters. Neither ruler opposed the new bill, and the power of the English monarch was diminished forever. Queen Mary died of smallpox in 1694, leaving King William alone to rule the English kingdom. Shortly after she passed, the king was notified of a Jacobite uprising in Scotland, and he led an army north to confront the rebels. The Jacobites were a group loyal to the deposed James II, and wanted to assassinate King William and restore James to the English throne. You see, after the Glorious Revolution, Parliament argued that King James had forfeited the English throne by fleeing, leaving room for William to take it not by force, but by invitation. This set a precedent of contract between the king and their people, where any breach, in this case, King James II fleeing the capital, could result in the legal deposition of the king at the hands of the people. Jacobites staunchly opposed this, believing that the king was chosen by God as a divine ruler and could not be removed, therefore making the post-1668 regime of King William illegitimate. The king swiftly crushed the Jacobite rebels, but their cause had not been defeated and they would continue to threaten the crown for decades to come. But for now, King William and the House of Stuarts were secure. Having had no children and with the death of his nephew, Prince William, Duke of Gloucester in 1700, the issue of succession soon took over as the main threat to Stuart rule. Not wanting to give the Jacobites any room to maneuver, he decided to name Anne, Queen Mary's sister and daughter of James II, as the successor to the English throne. On the 8th of March, 1702, King William joined his wife in death after contracting pneumonia while he recovered from a broken collarbone he'd sustained falling off his horse. His reign had been incredibly stable, and he was a popular figure in the realm, both with Parliament and the people. The stability he ushered was a welcome change as the iron grip of religious tensions appeared to have relaxed somewhat, and was crowned shortly after his death and inherited a peaceful, prosperous kingdom. 
Queen Anne was no stranger to the island, and had already been a notable figure during the reign of her sister and brother-in-law before her. When she came to power herself in 1702, she had long established herself within the English upper class, and enjoyed popular support from powerful nobles and politicians alike. For the first part of her reign, Queen Anne was under the influence of Sarah, Duchess of Marlborough, and her husband, John Churchill. Eventually, though, Queen Anne and the Duchess fell out with one another, but not before the Churchills rose to prominence and power in the kingdom. John Churchill established himself as a premier naval captain who earned acclaim for his role in the Spanish War of Succession. The Churchills would continue to play a large role in English history for the coming generations all culminating in their ancestor, Sir Winston Churchill, leading England through the Second World War. When we look back at the reign of Queen Anne, the most enduring and notable part of it is without a doubt the formation of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. While Ireland was subordinate to England, and Wales had long been made a part of the Kingdom of England, Scotland was still its own sovereign state. Queen Anne sought to change that expressing her desires to unite the two kingdoms as early as her coronation speech at Westminster Abbey. In 1707, she got her wish with the Act of the Union. The Kingdom of Scotland and the Kingdom of England unified to form one sovereign state, Great Britain. A new flag was adopted to symbolize the unity of the two realms, giving birth to the Union Jack. Now, unlike her Catholic father, James II, Anne had been raised Anglican and as such supported policies and policy makers who shared in her religious views. She famously favored the Anglican majority Tory party in government, but faced increasing opposition from the Whigs, who had grown in power since the War of the Spanish Succession. Things came to a head in 1710 when she dismissed many Whig politicians from Parliament for their hawkish behavior and continued insistence on an English presence in a European war. But the conflict had its upsides. The English Navy had been revitalized and rebuilt since the early Stuart days, earning itself a fierce reputation on the high seas as one of the most formidable navies in the world. A powerful navy also helped bolster colonial expansion, as territories in the Americas were quickly developing into profitable and important territories thanks to the tobacco farms and growing slave trade. But while the kingdom flourished, Queen Anne privately suffered. She lost her husband, Prince George of Denmark, only a decade into her reign, and towards the end of her life, she suffered from severe ill health. She gained a lot of weight and had a stroke that left her without the ability to speak towards the latter half of her life. Not long after that, Queen Anne died on the morning of the 1st of August, 1714. Her doctors thought that her death was a release from a life of ill health and tragedy. Despite 17 pregnancies, none survived, and as such, Queen Anne had no one to succeed her on the throne. Because of the ban on Catholic monarchs, and needed to find a suitable Protestant successor, it was decided that her cousin, George I of the House of Hanover, would take over the British crown. Queen Anne was the last Stuart ruler of England. For the first time since William the Conqueror almost 700 years ago, England would again have a truly foreign king sitting on its throne. But while the realm welcomed their new Protestant ruler, who had served with distinction during the Spanish War of Succession, there was just one glaring issue. King George I was outrageously unsuited to rule over the Kingdom of Great Britain. He didn't speak a word of English. He was pedantic, decidedly slow when it came to decision-making, and showed a great disinterest in ruling over the kingdom. As a result, he passed over the control and authority of the realm to a small group of trusted politicians. This was a role that would later be known as the Prime Minister, and officially gave birth to the cabinet system still used in England today. He was crowned on the 20th of October, 1714, and before he'd even had time to learn his counselors' names, he was quickly forced to deal with an old threat up north. Jacobites had once again landed in Scotland, seeking to overthrow the king and install James Stuart, son of James II, as the King of Great Britain. Like King William before him, the new King George easily quashed the rebel army, 
and James Stewart, later called the Old Pretender, fled to France, just like his father had. Meanwhile, back in Westminster, Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough, had now returned from Spain and came to the king to cash in his checks. The War of Spanish Succession had been fought on credit, with the idea that once it was over, the English crown would repay Marlborough for his men and material. But there was just one issue. The crown was in serious debt and, in theory, couldn't pay Churchill what he was owed. King George was himself a big spender and famously had a number of mistresses who abused the court's finances, racking up huge bills on luxury goods and fine dining. So, King George I and his financial advisors came up with a plan. They created the South Sea Company, a shell company, little more than paper on some clerk's desk, that would assume the 31 million pound national debt and turn it into company stock to be sold off to investors. This would, in theory, allow the crown to recoup their money and repay Churchill without bankrupting itself. But the stock was grossly overinflated and inevitably it crashed, bankrupting investors and the government all at once. Westminster was in disarray. Lord Stanhope, who was personally innocent of any wrongdoing, apparently collapsed and died after a stressful debate on the matter in the House of Lords. It was during this time that Robert Walpole rose to prominence. His expert management of the crisis and rescheduling of the debts allowed the kingdom to return to some financial stability and saved King George from disgrace. For his actions, he was promoted and became England's first de facto prime minister. In the aftermath of the crisis, the Bank of England took over in managing the crown and government funds a move which eventually led to England's economy becoming the best managed in the world over the next century. However, King George, who was already an unpopular figure, had become borderline despised as a result of the South Sea fiasco. And with the establishment of the office of Prime Minister, royal power was once again undermined forever. King George I died from a stroke while visiting his native Hanover in June 1727. He is the most recent English king to be buried outside of Great Britain. His son, George II, was to take over the throne. George followed in his father's footsteps as a firmly German English king. He is the most recent king born outside of England and chose to spend the majority of his time as ruler abroad in Hanover, where he exercised considerably more control over the running of the realm. You see, almost all of the domestic running of Great Britain now fell into the hands of Parliament and the new Prime Minister, and King George II grew frustrated at the lack of influence he had as a royal. He was able to exercise some control over matters of international policy and warfare, but those decisions were few and far between. One of these moments was the Third Jacobite Uprising led by the young pretender Bonnie Prince Charles, another son of the former James II, the Jacobite rebels amassed support in Scotland and marched south in English territory, hoping to depose the Hanoverian monarchy. Charles Stuart had hoped that upon his arrival in England, he would be flooded with popular support and easily overpower the unpopular Hanoverian king. But he was wrong. While his army was able to get as far south as Derby, they were plagued by indecisive leadership and failed to gather any support in the realm. Fearing a retaliation from the king, Charles Stuart retreated back to Scotland, where he prepared to face King George's troops. At the Battle of Culloden in 1745, the final Jacobite stand would be slaughtered by William, Duke of Cumberland, on behalf of the British crown. The fighting was brutal and William gave his men orders to spare no one, not even the wounded. Charles escaped the slaughter, making his way back to France, where he lived out the last of his days a drunkard. The Scottish nobles who had supported the Jacobites were mercilessly rounded up and executed. It was so brutal that Cumberland earned himself the nickname Butcher Cumberland for his actions north of the border. But the revolt had been quashed, and finally, the Jacobite threat had been silenced forever. The uprisings give us a unique look into how life during King George's reign was perceived. Life was good, placid, and peaceful, and it was clear that there was no genuine animosity for the king as exhibited by the lack of popular support 
the uprisings garnered. While the king was by no means popular, there was little incentive to depose him. The everyday running of the realm was firmly in the hands of parliament, and a new king was not likely to change that. And this domestic comfort was very much a side effect of Britain's growing international successes. The East India Trading Company that had been set up almost 100 years before defeated a combined army of French and Indian troops on the Indian subcontinent, earning themselves a total monopoly in the region. Elsewhere, the Seven Years' War was raging, with fighting taking place as far away as the New World in the first truly global conflict. Britain was ultimately victorious against the French, gaining new territories in Canada, Florida, Grenada, Senegal, and east of the Mississippi. Great Britain was beginning to emerge as the most dominant force, not just in Europe, but on the entire planet. King George II lived to be 77 years old, then the oldest ruler in the nation's history. But by the end of his life, he was completely deaf and blind in one eye, and as a result spent much of his time bedbound and unwell. He died on the 25th of October 1760, after collapsing near his closed stool, a precursor to the modern toilet. Because his eldest son, Frederick, Prince of Wales, had died suddenly in 1751, succession was passed on to Frederick's son, George III. Despite England enjoying a period of remarkable growth and expansion abroad, opening new museums and extinguishing long-standing threats, King George was remembered by his contemporaries as a buffoon, ruled by wives and ministers. He was considered an inept ruler, and subsequent memoirs all painted an image of a king engorged on pleasure and drink. But had they known who was to come next, the buffoon and his wife might not have been treated so harshly after all. There was no way to know that the reign of King George III was to be one of the most tumultuous and eventful in English history. Domestically, internationally, and personally, George III faced pressure and conflict at every turn. Crowned on the 22nd of September, 1761, King George III differed from his grandfather and great-grandfather in the sense that he was more English than they ever were. He was born on the island, spoke the language, and spent his formative years learning in the British Kingdom. Those who hoped this would make him a more capable regent were quickly brought back to reality. King George III would frequently become afflicted with bouts of debilitating madness, rendering him incapable of ruling and sending Westminster into disarray. This earned the king the nickname Mad King George, and there were many attempts by Parliament to install his son, the Prince of Wales, to the throne, but every time they tried, King George would regain his senses and resume his rule before any permanent decisions had been made. His early rule was defined mainly by conflict, both at home and abroad. The American War of Independence was won by the colonists in 1783, severing the Americas from the British control forever, and giving birth to the United States of America as an independent nation. Closer to home, King George was forced to deal with the Gordon Riots of 1780, where a mob of protesters rioted against the specter of Catholic emancipation and left the city looted and burnt after three days of violence. Before that, in 1799, the United Irishmen rebelled on behalf of the Irish people and demanded Irish autonomy from Great Britain. They were easily defeated at Vinegar Hill, and two years later, Ireland was officially unified into the Kingdom of Great Britain, forming the United Kingdom that still stands today. But framing all this was the Napoleonic Wars. A Corsican general with a skill for warfare and lofty ambitions had quickly come to dominate Europe, plunging the continent into a state of perpetual warfare. Fighting was sporadic, and a number of coalitions were formed to try and defeat the pint-sized general. British naval victories in the Nile and at Trafalgar earned the United Kingdom a reputation as the fiercest navy in the world, while the land war in Spain decisively pushed Napoleon out of the Iberian Peninsula. Britain was eventually victorious at Waterloo, marking the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815. Historians often cite this as the moment Britain became the most dominant power in the world. Under George III, the early Industrial Revolution also began, as steam engines were introduced to the British workforce. Protests against these new machines were common, 
and culminated in the Luddite protest, where farm workers broke into factories and smashed up the machinery for taking their jobs away from them. The rapid changes in the workforce, alongside the economic disaster that was the Napoleonic Wars, meant that social unrest in Britain was at an all-time high. Mass unemployment, depression, and civil unrest ran rampant, and the king's response was to ruthlessly quash dissent, usually by force. And keep in mind, during all this, King George would often descend into crippling bouts of madness, leaving the realm without its figurehead for months at a time. In 1810, Parliament had had enough. It was clear that George could no longer rule, and it was decided that his son, George IV, would take over as regent in his place. King George lived for another 10 years while his son ruled in his place. When he died, age 81, in 1820, he was the longest reigning and longest living British monarch in history. To this day, he's still the oldest reigning male king of England. George, Prince of Wales, or Prinny as he was known to those closest to him, had already been ruling over Britain as regent since 1810, but after the death of his father in 1820, he ascended to the throne as King George IV. Following in his father's footstep, King George IV was known as an impulsive, extravagant, and morally dubious man who enjoyed the finer things in life and behaved in a way that was altogether unkingly. He had the Brighton Pavilion built as an homage to East Asia right here on the English coast. Its gaudy and lavish design was polarizing at the time, but it has since become a national treasure. He remodeled Buckingham Palace and rebuilt Windsor Castle to reflect the splendor and power of the English crown. On a personal level, King George was known for being something of a ladies' man. Now, while having multiple mistresses wasn't uncommon, it was his behavior with them that earned him the scorn of his cabinet. One, a lady, Mrs. Fitzherbert, was said to have married the king in secret, and a tunnel from Brighton Pavilion leads directly into her home nearby. As a prince, King George earned himself a reputation as an extremely charming and cultured man. He is often remembered as the first gentleman of England but faced an increasingly hostile public after his ascension to the throne. Crowned on the 19th of July, 1821, there was drama on the day of his coronation, as the new king attempted to have his wife, Caroline of Brunswick, barred from the ceremony. He then petitioned Parliament for help in getting a divorce. Under British law, a divorce could only be granted on the grounds of adultery. Since neither King George or Caroline would admit to that, the king got creative he tried to pass the Bill of Pains and Penalties, essentially a public trial that accused his wife of adultery and planned to use Parliament as his judge and jury to get a divorce and deny Carolyn her right as Queen of England. The debate was heavily reported in the press and public opposition to the bill was high. It eventually passed, but only just, and as public unrest towards the bill grew, the government decided to withdraw the bill in an effort to save the reputation of the royal crown. But the damage had been done. The court of King George IV developed a reputation for extravagance and scandal. George was himself an impulsive and unreliable statesman who frequently behaved selfishly and drew the ire of many in his cabinet. The king's power continued to diminish and George was forced to accept Catholic emancipation a reversal of many of the anti-Catholic legislation that had been passed since the reign of Henry VIII, despite being staunchly opposed to it. Catholics were once again given the right to vote, hold public office, and sit in Parliament. It was also during the reign of King George IV that the first regular police force in London was established by Robert Peel. But a life of overindulgence and grandeur had its toll on the king, by the time he ascended to the throne, he had gained so much weight that he was the subject of much ridicule during public appearances. He reached a whopping 17 stone, or 108 kilograms, and after a decade on the throne, his lifestyle had caught up to him. King George IV died on the 26th of June, 1830, surrounded by servants and cabinet members. A senior aide to the king privately confided in his diary, a more contemptible, cowardly, selfish, unfeeling dog does not exist. There have been good and wise kings, but not many of them, and this I believe to be one of the worst. 
As his only legitimate child had died a few years prior, the throne was to be given to his younger brother, William Henry. Nicknamed the Sailor King, William had spent the majority of his life at sea as part of the Royal Navy. He had been made Lord High Admiral in 1827 and inherited his brother's throne at the sprightly age of 64. Crowned on the 8th of September, 1831, King William's comparatively short reign was nonetheless highly transformative to British society. The poor laws were updated and streamlined, centralizing their administrative function and establishing workhouses across the country. Many of these reforms set as a precedent for the modern welfare system still used in Britain today. Meanwhile, child labor, which had been allowed to run rampant and unchecked since the start of the Industrial Revolution, was officially banned thanks to the Factory Act of 1833. King William also oversaw the passing of the Slave Abolition Act that same year, banning slavery in all its forms across the British Empire. It's worth noting, however, that the king was staunch anti-abolition and campaigned against the passing of the bill. Despite this, the new king was far less involved in politics than his brother and father before him. The crown's political influence had diminished past the point of no return, and after his failure to remove the Melbourne ministry, he resigned himself to matters away from politics for the remainder of his reign. He would be the last king to select a prime minister against the wishes of parliament. But away from the chatter and dealings of Westminster, King William's personal life was much more under his control. He was in a 20-year-long partnership with Irish actress Dorothea Bland, with whom he had 10 children, 5 boys and 5 girls. The pair appeared to have enjoyed each other's company, as evident by their extended courtship and drama-free years together. William's father, King George III, was supportive of his son's relationship and bestowed onto William the title of Ranger of Bushy Park, a role which included a large residence known as Bushy House on the outskirts of London. But Dorothea Bland would never be queen as the pair split in 1811. Bland was given custody of the five girls and paid a monthly sum for their upkeep under the condition that she never returned to the stage. She, however, did return to acting, hoping to earn some extra money to pay off a debt one of her daughter's husbands had incurred. When news reached William, he stopped paying her monthly allowance, and she eventually fled to France to avoid the debtors, who she'd failed to pay off. She died impoverished in 1816. Just a few years later, William's search for a proper wife concluded with his marriage to Adelaide of saxe meiningen She was of royal stock, in her prime childbearing years, and it's reported that she and William became extremely fond of one another. This luck continued well into kingship, as William proved himself to be an expert diplomat, especially on the international stage. He oversaw the initial phases of the construction of the Suez Canal, and stressed the importance of its ability to garner good relations between the British Crown and Egypt. He also helped repair Britain's relationship with America, which had suffered immensely under King George III. At a dinner party with the American ambassador, King William loudly proclaimed his regret for not being born a free, independent American. So much did he respect that nation which had given birth to George Washington, the greatest man that ever lived. Anglo-American relations steadily improved under his rule, and the two nations are still close to this day. But for all his charm and diplomatic tact, he and Adelaide had no surviving children, and as such, King William was presented with a succession crisis towards the end of his life. The king was extremely fond of his niece, Princess Alexandrina Victoria of Kent, and named her as his heir during his final birthday banquet. By this time, the king was gravely ill, but wanted to survive to see his niece turn 18, ensuring that the crown was passed directly to her and not placed under a regency council as was custom for under-18s. His last year alive was a torturous one. Princess Adelaide reportedly stayed by his side, refusing to go to bed for 10 days as his health worsened. King William IV died in the early hours of the 20th of June, 1837. He was the last Hanoverian king to rule over England. At just 18 years old, Victoria found herself at the head of the greatest empire the world had ever seen. 
As it was against Hanoverian law for a woman to rule over the province, the new queen was stripped of her role as ruler of the Kingdom of Hanover. However, by now, Britain had emerged as the most dominant superpower on the planet. Under her rule, the empire would reach its territorial peak, controlling 35.5 million square kilometers. It was and still stands as the largest empire ever seen in human history. On the 28th of June, 1838, 400,000 people traveled to the capital to see Victoria ascend to the British throne. She became the first monarch to take up permanent residence at Buckingham Palace, which has since become the administrative and residential headquarters for the royal family in England. But the cheer and pomp soon faded, and the start of her reign was fraught with social tension and conflict in the realm. There had been a widespread demand for electoral reform and calls for universal male suffrage reigning across the kingdom as ordinary men demanded the right to vote. There were also calls to abolish the Corn Law, which heavily taxed imported grains and barley that came into the island. In 1846, the Corn Laws were repealed and free trade won out, greatly improving the standard of living and contributing to a Victorian-era boom in population. Unlike her uncle William, Queen Victoria sought to involve herself in politics far more than she really should have. Because of the laws that prohibited the English monarch from meddling in political matters, she had to get creative. The Queen attempted to influence government outcome and ministerial policy through private meetings and backroom dealings, something she quickly developed a talent for. As an astute diplomat, she knew how to conduct herself in the murky political world of Victorian England, and as such was far more successful in influencing the decision-making processes of Parliament and her lords. However, she publicly maintained her image as a busy and charitable monarch who directly involved herself in a number of public works projects. Under her husband's patronage, the first World Fair was held in London in 1851. Prince Albert directly oversaw the construction of the Crystal Palace, which stood in Sydenham until it burned down, and welcomed exhibits from all over the empire in a show of unity and strength. But while the World Fair may have bolstered these ideas of togetherness at home, the reality of things was very different. In 1857, the Crimean War broke out as a result of growing tensions on the continent between emerging superpowers and old empires in the East. Britain chose to fight for the Ottomans against Russia, wanting to maintain the balance of power in Europe and limit Russian expansion. Despite the war's unpopularity at home, Britain and her allies were eventually victorious, and Europe was once again stable. But before any celebrations could be had, the Indian mutiny called the army's attention once more, and resulted in the British taking complete administrative control over the subcontinent of India. As a result, Queen Victoria officially became Victoria, Empress of India. Previously, the Indian government had worked alongside the British East India Company in the day-to-day -day ruling of the region. However, after the mutineers were put down and the rebellion quashed, the British government ousted both the Indians and the East India Company from their administrative positions and took control for themselves. During a proclamation to the Indian people, the Queen promised her new subjects rights and freedoms equal to that of the British public. These rights were not always maintained, and her proclamation was referred to many times during the long fight for Indian independence. Back in London, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert had been steadily reproducing, giving birth to a total of nine children, all of whom married into European royal families. This earned the Queen the nickname the Grandmother of Europe. The death of Albert in 1860 devastated Victoria who fell into a prolonged period of mourning. The previously active monarch was seldom seen by her cabinet, and for a time disappeared completely from the public stage. In her absence, British republicanism grew, and there were real murmurs in the capital of a potential revolution against the royal institutions, but these amounted to nothing. She would eventually compose herself and resume a life in the public eye, but continued to mourn, wearing black until the day she died. The queen ruled for 40 more years without her prince, and in that time, her kingdom erupted as a center of industry, art, and science in the world. Factories dominated the landscape from London to Glasgow as new cities tripled in size, 
places like Birmingham and Manchester, which had before only been minor villages and settlements, were now the second and third largest cities in the country. Great writers produced some of their finest works. Bram Stoker wrote Dracula, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote Sherlock Holmes, and Charles Dickens published some of the greatest works of literary fiction in the English language since Shakespeare. Advancements in science and medicine also progressed massively under her rule. Darwin published his theories on the evolution of man. Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone and germ theory became the leading idea that pushes medicine and the prevention of disease forwards. After King George III, Queen Victoria stands as the second longest reigning monarch in British history. Her golden and diamond jubilees were a time of great celebration, and her 63-year reign remains an iconic chapter in British history referred to as the Victorian era. In 1901, while on a trip to Osborne House on the Isle of Wight, Queen Victoria died from a stroke at 81 years of age. Her death marked the end of the House of Hanover and its rule on the British Isles. With the throne now passed on to her son Edward, Britain had to leave its ancient queen behind as it ran headfirst into the modern age. Perhaps if it knew what that meant, it might not have done so as willingly. As the first of the modern monarchs of Britain, King Edward VII exemplified many of the tropes and ideas we associate with the royal family today. Throughout his time as the Prince of Wales and later as King, he traveled extensively throughout the country and the world, performing traditional ceremonies to the public and acting as a figurehead to institutions and charities. King Edward oversaw the crown's shift to being a vehicle for public philanthropy as he opened new bridges, schools, and hospitals in an effort to modernize the role of the royal family. Since monarchical influence in politics was now legally prohibited, King Edward took a leaf out of his mother's book and took to the shadows to impose his will. He reinvented royal diplomacy, fostering good relations with many of the powerful elite in Europe, most notably the French, for whom he was called Peacemaker. But he was not always successful in these endeavors. He married Alexandra of Denmark in 1863, and together they had six children. Like in the reign of his mother, King Edward ruled over an island that was rapidly changing. Scientific and technological advancements doubled year on year as man took flight. Wireless signals were sent across the Atlantic, and the South Pole was reached by humans for the first time in human history. But for all its developments in science and culture, the Edwardian era is best remembered for the rise of socialism. All across the world, the working classes had benefited from increased education and literacy, and as such, at the start of the century, a huge number of poor British subjects had become educated and increasingly vocal about their rights as humans. Murmurs of independence rang throughout Britain's colonies, and strong attempts were made to erode the long-standing class divides that had kept hold in England since the reign of King Egbert all those years before. At the time of his death in 1910, King Edward VII faced a constitutional crisis, spurred on by socialism and its ideals. A year prior, the Liberal Party had enacted the People's Budget, an unprecedented set of new taxes against the richest in the realm that was intended to help fund social housing projects across Britain. The House of Commons passed it, but when it came to the House of Lords, an unelected council who sit for life, it was vetoed. Technically speaking, the House of Lords had every right to do this. But there had been a long-standing honor code between the two branches of government that essentially said the House of Lords was not supposed to amend money bills, as only the House of Commons had the power to decide on the monarch's resources. Their block of the bill, while not illegal, was in bad spirit, and further emphasized the growing social divide in the kingdom. Many in Parliament believed their system of government needed to be reformed. It was under this unrest that King Edward VII died on the 6th of May 1910. He left the throne to his son George, who was to inherit not just a fractured kingdom, but a planet on the verge of tearing itself apart. But before he was accosted by arms races and constitutional crises, George was a young man who was not always meant to be king. 
The second son of King Edward, he spent his youth serving abroad in the Royal Navy, enjoying his freedom and reveling in the life of a prince. However, fate had other plans for him, and after his brother and the heir to the British throne, Prince Albert, died unexpectedly in 1892, George was hurriedly recalled to Britain to begin a life of preparation and education to eventually ascend to the British throne. He married his brother's fiance, Princess Victoria Mary of Teck, and together the pair had six children. In 1910, with the passing of his father, George was crowned King Emperor of the United Kingdom. On the 22nd of June, to joyous celebrations in the capital, the constitutional crisis that had defined the end of his father's reign was quickly dealt with thanks to the Parliament Act of 1911, which saw the House of Commons establish legal supremacy over the House of Lords. England itself was experiencing a period of civil unrest and social upheaval. The socialist ideals that had been gaining popularity now had Europe in a vice grip. Irish politicians began calling for home rule and separation from the British Kingdom, while socialist politicians grew in numbers, power, and ambition within the House of Commons. But all this turmoil was about to take a back seat as Europe erupted into warfare. The First World War had begun. On the 4th of August 1914, four years after his coronation, King George V declared war on Germany. On the day of the declaration, the king wrote in his diary, I held a council at 1045 to declare war with Germany. It is a terrible catastrophe, but it is not our fault. Please to God, it may soon be over. It was not, and the war raged for four years as England and her allies battled against the Central Powers. It was a conflict that would claim the lives of around 40 million people, with fighting happening all over the world. The new machines which had taken society into the modern age now brought death on an industrial scale, and the war had a profound impact on the British psyche, inflicting scars that, to this day, have yet to heal. Even the king could not escape this. To him, the war was personal. The Russian Tsar and the German Kaiser were his cousins, as they shared ancestry to Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. The men had grown up together, spending summers at Buckingham Palace playing make-believe and fighting in homemade trenches in the palace gardens. Now, their countries played out these childhood fantasies with unforgiving brutality. Consequently, the English King George still carried a German surname, Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha. As anti-German sentiment skyrocketed, the king drew ire for his perceived connections to their new enemy. Famous English writer H.G. Wells wrote about Britain's alien and uninspiring court in reference to the king. George responded to the author, I may be uninspiring, but I'll be damned if I'm alien. To appease British nationalists, King George V changed his surname from the House of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha to the House of Windsor on the 17th of July, 1917. That same year, the Russians who had allied with Britain during the conflict had capitulated and Russia was overcome with the fervor of revolution. The downtrodden Russian people overthrew the Tsar and his family, imprisoning him and establishing the Soviet Union. Not only was the Tsar King George's cousin, but the two were dear friends, and George made plans to rescue his cousin from the revolutionaries that had arrested him and his family. But that same fervor that had led to revolution in Russia was beginning to bubble in Britain. Compounding social issues had decreased the quality of life in the country so much that there was a genuine fear of revolution similar to that of the Russian communists. King George worried that bringing the Romanovs, who represented all the gaudy excesses and societal disconnect between a king and his people, would look bad on the British crown. Tsar Nicholas and his family were gunned down by the revolutionaries, and Russia would never have a king again. By 1918, the war was over, the armistice was signed, and Germany sent their Kaiser into exile. Of the great European monarchies, only a few now stood. King George was alone. The later half of George's reign was dominated by the growing threat of socialism and its offshoots. Fascism, republicanism, communism, these political ideologies grew in popularity and promised the working classes of the world a chance at retribution and equality. 
The world had seen what communists were capable of during the Russian Revolution, and anti-communist sentiment perforated throughout the British upper class. The socialist labor movement had gained massive popularity in Parliament, but instead of an all-out revolt like in Russia, they sought to work alongside the king to introduce more democratic measures to the island. The king submitted to their demands, and together they revamped the role of the British monarchy, bringing it closer to the public and the working class. In 1926, King George became a central figure in the push for self-governance in the British dominions. In 1931, the Statute of Westminster gave territories like Australia and Canada greater autonomy and self-governance, while still keeping them firmly under the British crown. The king also oversaw Britain's financial recovery after the 1929 stock market crash. He encouraged the formation of a national government and agreed to reduce the civil list, essentially lowering the number of people on the government's payroll. All of this helped in stabilizing the economy, and as a result, Britain was able to maintain peace and a basic standard of living during a time when the entire world was reeling from economic hardship. He was deeply suspicious of the Nazi party, which had been rising in power in Germany following the First World War. In 1934, he told the German ambassador Leopold von Husch that should Germany continue on its current trajectory, there would be a war in Europe once again in the next 10 years. He was wrong, but only just. In 1935, a year before his death, George celebrated his Silver Jubilee to cheering crowds in the capital. He was a popular and well-loved king. The people respected him for his hard work and commitment to the empire, as well as his charity and care to the British public. As crowds waved him on, he reportedly said, I cannot understand it. After all, I'm only a very ordinary sort of fellow. His relationship with his eldest son, Edward, deteriorated towards the end of his life as he grew increasingly disappointed at Edward's inability to settle down and his continued affairs with married women. In contrast, he was deeply close to his second son, Albert, and became a doting grandfather to Albert's daughter, Prince Elizabeth, who referred to him as Grandpa England. In 1935, he said this of his eldest son, Edward, After I am dead, the boy will ruin himself within 12 months. I pray to God he does not marry and have children, and that nothing stands in the way of Bertie and Lilibet and the throne. On the evening of the 15th of January 1936, King George took to his bedroom, complaining of a cold. He never re-emerged. Five days later, when it was clear the king was going to die, his physician administered a mild sedative, intending to peacefully end the king's life. He argued that he wanted to preserve the monarch's dignity and spare him and his family any more suffering. It was decided that he would be killed by 11.55 p.m. to ensure that the news broke in time for the morning papers, and not the less inappropriate evening journals. Against the king's personal wishes, the British crown was passed on to his eldest son, Edward, Prince of Wales. As the second monarch of the House of Windsor, there were many in the kingdom who hoped that the crown would prove a stabilizing influence on the eccentric Prince Edward. It did not. The new king showed great impatience at following royal protocol and caused major concern amongst the political factions of Westminster for his complete disregard for established constitutional conventions. He caused a serious constitutional crisis only a month into his rule after he proposed to marry Wallace Simpson, an American woman who had divorced twice already. The British Prime Minister himself opposed the marriage, arguing that a twice-divorced woman with two living husbands was not a politically or socially acceptable person to have as queen consort. Furthermore, his proposed marriage would jeopardize his position as the head of the Church of England which forbade marrying a divorcee if their ex-partner was still alive. It became clear that if King went through with the marriage to Wallace, the Prime Minister and his cabinet would retire in protest. This was serious, as it would ruin his status as a politically neutral monarch, and could potentially draw opposition calling for the total removal of the royal institution as a whole. King Edward would have to choose between love or duty. He chose love. After only 326 days on the throne, King Edward VIII abdicated, 
Unknowingly, he had given his late father the very thing he had wished for. Prince Albert now would be King of Britain and her empire. Upon his accession to the throne, Prince Albert chose to adopt a regnal name and was thereafter known as King George VI. He was crowned on the 12th of May 1937 to much popularity, but behind the scenes the smiling king rejected his new position. He wrote in his diary that after hearing the news of his brother's decision to abdicate, he broke down and wept like a child. Rumors spread across the country that the new King George was physically and mentally unfit to rule. This is in some ways true. King George had a speech impediment and a stutter. Not the kind of trade you want when you need to portray yourself as a strong figurehead. He frequently saw a speech therapist, who was able to coach the king through his public engagements, and in all surviving recordings of the king, there is almost no noticeable stammer to be heard. The queen and I are very happy to be in Scotland once more. During the first years of his reign, King George toured in North America in an effort to bring the isolated Americans closer to the issues in Europe. You see, King George, along with the rest of Europe, knew that war was imminent. He was forced to publicly support British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's policy of appeasement, even bringing the Prime Minister onto the balcony of Buckingham Palace in an extraordinary show of unity. But it was increasingly clear that peace in our time? wasn't going to last very long. The king was well received in the US, and he was successful in shoring up American support in any upcoming conflicts. War broke out in Europe in 1939, after Hitler invaded Poland and prompted Britain to respond in the defense of her ally. Throughout the conflict, the king and queen decided to stay at the royal residence of Buckingham Palace. As a sign of unity and solidarity with the English people, a decision that made them wildly popular. As London suffered through the Blitz, the king and queen hunkered down, narrowly escaping death themselves as two German bombs landed in the palace gardens one night. They were subject to British rationing restrictions, just like everyone else, and were looked at around the world as model rulers who shared in their subject's suffering. His daughter, Princess Elizabeth, even enlisted in the army, mending jeeps as part of the Auxiliary Territorial Service. Unsurprisingly, Neville Chamberlain lost the ensuing election, and Winston Churchill took over as Prime Minister. While King George was initially hesitant of Churchill, the two quickly developed the closest personal relationship in modern British history between a monarch and a Prime Minister. Every Tuesday for four and a half years, the two men met to privately eat dinner and discuss the war with unparalleled frankness. In the meantime, the king and queen would regularly make visits to bombed-out houses and factories around the country, boosting morale as they went. King George even visited the army in France, Italy, North Africa, and Holland, and the British king became a symbol of national resistance across the globe. In 1945, the war was over. Guns ceased to fire and bombs stopped being dropped. Britain and her allies had won. During celebrations, crowds gathered outside Buckingham Palace chanting, We want the King! King George gave them what they wanted, and, echoing his actions almost six years ago, he brought Prime Minister Churchill onto the balcony to join him. This time, however, peace would last. King George even spoke at the First Assembly of the United Nations, which was held in London a year later. But while the war had strengthened his popularity at home, it had come at a monumental cost. Britain and her empire was in ruins. Financially, the fighting had destroyed large portions of England and her factories, while the Lend-Lease program had put the country in unimaginable amounts of debt with the US. Abroad, the many arms of the empire that had fought for the British crown now demanded independence. There had already been a move into recognizing some of Britain's overseas territories as independent dominions like Canada and Australia. But after the war, there was a clear shift towards recognizing all her territories as independent states. As colonial sentiment diminished, the British Empire was renamed and reorganized into the Commonwealth of Nations. Some stayed, while many chose to fully separate from the British crown. King George was named as head of the new Commonwealth, and as such, 
Nations like Canada, Belize, Jamaica, Australia, and New Zealand still recognized the king as their head of state, but others sought full independence. India became a republic, while the nations of Bangladesh and Pakistan were formed during the British split from the subcontinent. Britain and her territory shrank, and the empire where the sun never set was no more. But while the world celebrated peace, the king battled with the personal toll of the war. He was a heavy smoker and subsequently developed lung cancer. Alongside a laundry list of other ailments and the stress of the conflict pushed his ill health over the edge. His later years saw his daughter Elizabeth take over in many of the royal duties he could no longer attend. On the 31st of January, 1953, King George made the trip to London Airport, despite the advice of those closest to him, to see off Princess Elizabeth and her husband Philip Mountbatten as they embarked on a royal tour to Australia. It was his last public appearance. Six days later, King George VI was found dead in bed at Sandringham Castle at 56 years old. He was buried at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. Upon hearing the news of her father's death, Princess Elizabeth returned to England and took her place in history. At 25 years of age, Princess Elizabeth ascended to the British throne, becoming Queen Elizabeth II. It was the first televised coronation ceremony in British history, and over 100 million people tuned in worldwide to watch it. Prior to this, though, drama had already been brewing close to the new queen. There was the issue of the royal house, which needed to be sorted prior to her ascension. It was custom for the royal house to take after the husband's name, which in this case was House Montbatten after her husband Philip. The queen, however, had other ideas. She issued a declaration a month before the coronation stating that the royal house would go on as is, maintaining the name House Windsor. Philip complained, telling people, I am the only man in the country not allowed to give his name to his own children. Resentment against his role as royal consort would dominate the early years of their marriage. But Philip soon grew to be a loyal, comforting, and dutiful partner to the queen. Immediately after her coronation, Elizabeth and her husband embarked on a seven-month tour of the newly established Commonwealth of Nations. She was the first reigning monarch of Australia and New Zealand to visit those nations, and it's estimated that half of the Australian population came out to see the queen on her state visit. Throughout her life, she traveled extensively around the world, and by the end, she was the most widely traveled head of state in history. She was the first British monarch to visit a communist country, visiting Yugoslavia in the 70s, and her visit to the People's Republic of China in the 80s was the first state visit by a British monarch to China in the two countries' millennia-long history. But once she had returned from her tour and was once again back in Westminster, the Queen saw the political power of the monarchy diminish once again. You see, the ruling Conservative Party had no formal system for choosing a leader. So, after the resignation of Anthony Eden as Prime Minister, the burden fell to Queen Elizabeth to decide who would form the next government. She met with a small number of council members and politicians and appointed their recommended candidate, Harold Macmillan. This, alongside the failure of the Suez Crisis, would earn the Queen her first bit of major personal criticism. Lord Altrincham accused Elizabeth of being out of touch in a magazine which he owned and edited. This led to Altrincham being denounced by public figures and slapped by a member of the public for his comments against the Queen. Six years later, Macmillan himself retired, and the Queen was once again tasked with choosing a replacement. She selected Alec Douglas Home as Prime Minister, but again drew criticism for making her decision based on a small number of close advisors. In 1965, the Conservative Party established a formal mechanism for choosing their leader, and the Queen's direct involvement in politics was gone. But a further loss of political power was just the beginning. The process of decolonization that had begun in earnest during her father's reign had sped up in recent years. Africa rapidly shed the colonial shackles that Britain had imposed on her as 20 African nations gained full independence throughout the 1960s and 70s. As her power overseas weakened, Britain sought to join the European community. A precursor to the European Union, 
a goal it achieved in 1973. There was great concern during this time about the power and influence of the crown, especially amongst her dominions. Australian republicanism was on the rise, and Canada's Prime Minister, Pierre Trudeau, seemed to wholly disregard the reagent in her importance, sliding down the banisters at Buckingham Palace and pirouetting behind the Queen's back during a state visit to London. A few years later, when Canadian politicians were sent to London to discuss the patriation of the Canadian Constitution, they found Queen Elizabeth to be better informed than any of the British politicians and bureaucrats. Canada would get its independence in 1982, but the Queen maintained her role as their head of state. She suffered great embarrassment when the surveyor of the Queen's pictures, Anthony Blunt, was unmasked as a communist spy, and during the 80s, numerous attempts at her life were made, none proving successful, but each growing in danger and intensity. During a trooping of the color in 1981, six shots were fired at the Queen in close range as she rode her horse down the mall in London. That October, during a state visit to New Zealand, a 17-year-old Christopher John Lewis fired a shot from a 22 rifle at the Queen as she stepped out of her vehicle. A year later, an intruder broke into Buckingham Palace and sat watching the Queen sleep. When she awoke, the two calmly chatted while Elizabeth waited for palace police to arrive. In all instances, the Queen escaped harm. Throughout all this, she had managed to endear herself to the public, showing immense poise and grace during each and every attempt on her life. Royal popularity was relatively high, but the 1990s would prove to be a difficult decade for not just the Queen, but the monarchical institution as a whole. During a speech to mark her Ruby Jubilee, the Queen commented on her Annus Horribilis, or Horrible Year, in 1992. Many of her children had suffered highly public breakdowns in their marriages. Prince Andrew had separated from his wife Sarah, while Princess Anne had officially divorced Captain Mark Phillips. But the biggest blow to royal popularity came with her eldest son Prince Charles and his now estranged wife Diana. On the 7th of June, Diana published her tell-all memoir, Diana the True Story, revealing all the problems in her marriage and the stifling atmosphere of the royal family. It went into sordid detail about Charles' affair with Camilla Parker Bowles, and made Diana incredibly popular with the public, all while bringing down the reputation of the crown and besmirching the heir to the British throne. A fire broke out in Buckingham Palace in November of that year, and it was under all these events and more that the Queen remarked, 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. The 90s saw the Crown combat the rise of tabloid journalism. Sensational headlines and growing personal dramas made the royal family a frequent front-page presence. In 1997, Diana, who by now had officially separated from Charles, died in a high-speed car crash in France after being followed by paparazzi. The Queen took her young grandchildren to Balmoral Castle so that the young boys could grieve in private, away from the intense media coverage. But the Crown's silence and seclusion led to a wave of public outrage. Later, rumors would arise that the Queen had ordered Diana's death. But these claims are unsubstantiated, and a toxicology report on the driver showed he was drunk at the time of the accident. Before the end of the century, the Queen would play an integral part in the devolution of the UK Parliament, formally opening the new legislatures in Wales and Scotland. In 2002, she celebrated her Golden Jubilee to enormous crowds that surprised even the Queen herself. A decade later, she would see the same crowds celebrating her Diamond Jubilee. That summer, the Queen opened the 2012 Olympic Games, becoming the first head of state to open two Olympic ceremonies after her role in the 1972 Montreal Olympics. But as she crept steadily into old age, the well-traveled and beloved Queen began to slow down. She had a number of surgeries and minor health scares, and officially gave up driving on public roads after an accident involving her husband in 2019. In September 2015, Queen Elizabeth II became the longest reigning monarch in British history, overtaking Queen Victoria who had ruled over 150 years ago. 
A few years later, she became the first British monarch to celebrate a sapphire jubilee, as well as a platinum wedding anniversary to Philip. She was present at the marriage of her grandson and eventual heir to the throne, Prince William and Kate Middleton, as well as the marriage of Prince Harry and actress Meghan Markle. In 2022, she celebrated her platinum jubilee, marking 70 years on the British throne. That year, she became the second longest living monarch in history, behind King Louis XIV of France, who had ruled for 72 years. By this time, though, the queen was visibly much frailer, and soon passed public appearances and engagements over to her son Charles. On the 8th of September, the queen fell ill and her family rushed from all over the globe to be by her side. She died peacefully at 1510 British Standard Time at Balmoral Castle in 2022, age 96. Her reign spanned an immensely transformative period of not just royal history, but world history. The crown had undoubtedly fallen in power, but the queen and her conduct ensured that it held on to its prestige. She was a well-respected stateswoman, and during her reign, her popularity remained steadily positive, despite moments of tension and drama. She made the transition into the technological age, with all its trappings, seamlessly and with grace, modernized the role of the monarch for the 21st century, and earned the respect of people all over the globe. Her death was widely mourned and attended by 500 heads of state. In her wake, the British throne was left to her son, Charles. Crowned on the 6th of May, 2023, King Charles III is the latest in a long line to sit on the British throne. He has been an active member of the royal family since his youth, speaking out in support of climate change, royal reforms, and sustainable farming since the 1960s. His high-profile and bitter divorce from Diana Spencer made the prince a polarizing and, at times, unpopular figure in the kingdom. His subsequent marriage to Camilla Parker Bowles a year after the death of Diana drew widespread public scrutiny, but his reputation held on, and he has since become an outspoken advocate for environmentalism, historical conservation, and a reduction in size of the British monarchy. While with Diana, he had two sons, Prince William, heir to the British throne, and Prince Harry. He has maintained a close relationship to both boys. However, after the marriage of Harry and Meghan in 2018, and the subsequent fallout between Harry and the royal institution, the pair have been increasingly estranged. Ascending to the throne at 73 years of age, King Charles III became the oldest person to be crowned King of Britain, and his coronation took place at Westminster Abbey, as custom still dictates. Only time will tell how the reign of Charles III will pan out, Despite his age, the kingdom is undergoing immense change, both politically and socially. And if his predecessor's long lives are anything to go by, Charles should sit for a good while still. Britain has now officially separated from the European Union. Migration to the island remains higher than ever before, and the country is suffering through some of the worst recessions in its history, putting untold strain on the National Health Service and welfare systems. The Conservative Party have enjoyed over a decade of uninterrupted rule, and social tension calling for government reform grows louder every year. This is the kingdom Charles has inherited. By comparison, he is a very modern king. He understands that the role of the monarchy must continue to change, or else risk being left behind. It remains to be seen, will he rise to the challenge, or could King Charles III be the last king of Great Britain.